My name is Marcus Wilde, and this happened to me on October 12, 2021. I've worked in the CIA for almost two decades now. Most of that time was office drudgery. You know, the kind they show in movies, except without the exciting spy music and tailored Italian suits. I was always more of a paper pusher, an analyst. A few years ago, though, my division opened up a new department. Something different. They didn't explain much, just that I fit the profile. I figured, why not? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I never could have imagined where it would lead. Turns out the new gig involved investigating stuff the bigwigs deem. High strangeness. Sightings, encounters, disappearances, things that didn't make sense under the normal rules. My first assignment took me to the desolate backcountry of Nevada. The brief was thin. Something had been snatching hikers in the Ruby Mountains wilderness area. It left little mess, less evidence, and the disappearances baffled the local sheriff's department. They eventually roped in the park service but came up empty-handed. So, there I was, freshly minted X-Files agent, hiking the same trails as those who never returned. I carried a sidearm, of course, but was unsure what good it would do against, well, whatever was out there. The Ruby Mountains are stark, beautiful, and empty. I had hiked for four days without seeing another soul, despite it being peak fall foliage season. The leaves were fire, the silence oppressive, and gnawing unease ate at me. I spent my nights in one of the small fire watchtowers dotting the hills just in case whatever was out there was nocturnal. The afternoon of the fourth day, I found the first sign. It was a campsite, barely disturbed, yet clearly abandoned. Sleeping bag unrolled, gear neatly stacked, but no people. A chill went down my spine, this was too similar to the other disappearances. A glint of metal caught my eye, and I moved closer to a pile of equipment. It was a camera, its lens shattered as if by a precise blow. Shuffling through the contents of a bag, I found several rolls of developed film. In a move that felt lifted from a bad horror flick, I slotted a roll into the camera and held it up to the failing light. A series of unremarkable landscape photos flicked by. Then, something else. Blurry shapes moving through the trees at uncanny speed. Too tall, too long, and the next image was even worse. A lone hiker, back turned to the camera, unaware of the hulking, contorted figure leaping on him from the shadowed brush. My heart pounded. Dropping the camera... I instinctively reached for my sidearm. A deep guttural growl vibrated through the silence. It came from above me. I spun around. It was crouched on the fire tower's platform, silhouette hunched against the blood-red sunset. Its form was wrong. Twisted limbs, fingers far too long, and a head far too large for its slender body. Yellow eyes glittered in the fading light filled with malevolent intelligence. It lunged. I barely had time to raise my gun, firing wildly. The shots echoed through the mountains, but they didn't seem to stop it. Its unnatural agility was terrifying, like watching a spider in human-shaped dart and weave around my clumsy movements. The acrid smell of its breath filled my nostrils. As it closed in, I stumbled back against the railing of the tower. I was out of ammo. Fear jolted through me. My world narrowed down to its dripping jaws and the empty drop below me. In a split-second decision, I leaped backward, grasping the railing and letting myself fall into the twilight. There was the impact, the shock of cold water as I hit a deep creek bed far below, then scrambling and running downstream driven by pure, unthinking panic. I hid until morning, huddled under a rocky overhang. My ankle felt broken, 
every sound like the creature coming back for me. Finally, as the first rays of dawn painted the sky, I risked limping toward the nearest road, praying for a passing car. Luck was on my side. A ranger on patrol, shocked and concerned, found me a few hours later. I was in rough shape cut, bruised, hypothermic, and probably babbling about monsters. I was taken to a hospital, and my story was met with the predictable mix of skepticism and thinly veiled concern about my mental health. Officially, the incident was ruled a freak accident in the wilderness. My supervisors at the CIA were more understanding, or at least feigned it well. My shattered camera and the damaged roll of film somehow vanished from my hospital room and were never recovered. They reassigned me back to my old desk job, and I suspect the only reason I wasn't completely written off is I was always a by-the-books kind of guy. No one believes me, of course. It sounds insane, even to my own ears. But I know what I saw. The creature out there, whatever it is, is still roaming the wild places. The memory haunts me, and I'm filled with a terrible dread for anyone unlucky enough to cross its path. My name's Alex Tanner, and this happened to me in 2012. I work solo mostly. Agency gives me assignments, drops me in the middle of nowhere, then lets me find my own way back. My marriage didn't survive the lifestyle. Ex-wife thinks I'm an accountant, which may be safer for everyone in the long run. This mission started with whispers. Rumors of people vanishing in a remote corner of Utah Canyon country. Not tourists, mind you. Locals. Old-timers who knew the back trails. Folks assumed they'd just gotten lost, until some of their remains turned up. Now, remains out in the wilderness aren't that unusual. Accidents happen. Animal attacks, sure. But these... They showed a kind of violence beyond cougars or wolves. The reports had me puzzled. Messy. Overkill, but with a strange precision. The locals were spooked, talking of something monstrous, something not natural. That's where I come in. The canyons were a maze of red rock and shadows when I set out. Hiked in under cover of darkness, set up camp in a hidden gully place gives me the creeps, to be honest. A stillness, unnatural for the desert. Even the insects seem subdued. Spent two days watching, waiting. Third night it happened. Near full moon. I dozed off and woke to a prickling at the back of my neck. Movement in the darkness. Slow. Purposeful. My night vision's decent. I saw the silhouette against the skyline. Thing was huge, loping on two legs with an awkward grace. Too elongated to be human. Too controlled to be an animal. There was intelligence in its movements, a chilling sort of focus. The next moments are a blur. I grabbed my rifle, not sure if it'd work against this, but something was better than nothing. It saw me then. It let out a hissing wail and lunged. I fired two shots, and it didn't even slow. I scrambled back, gun clattering from my grip, and tripped on a rock. The thing was on me in a flash. It had hands, long-fingered and tipped with what looked like claws. One slashed across my chest. Pain exploded, white and blinding. I managed to grab my backup pistol and fired point-blank. The creature screeched and stumbled back, giving me space to roll away. I glimpsed the damage I'd done, holes in its torso leaking some kind of black, oily fluid. Yet it still moved, still stared at me with those burning eyes. There was no winning this fight. I turned and ran, 
fumbling through the darkness. I heard it crashing after me, but the canyons were a labyrinth. I sprinted, dodged, stumbled for what felt like hours. Sweat stung my eyes, blood pounded in my ears. Had to keep running. Had to survive. Finally, I risked a glance back. Nothing. I slumped to the ground, lungs aching, chest throbbing. That's when I heard the whimpering. A young woman was huddled a few yards away, staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. She was trembling, covered in dirt and scratches. I thought. I thought it had. She swallowed, voice hoarse. Been running for days. Turns out her name was Sarah. Local hiker who had ventured too far off the trail. The creature had snatched her three nights ago. Somehow, she'd kept ahead of it, kept hidden. That takes guts I can barely fathom. Getting out of there was another hell. Dawn was breaking, and that meant danger. The creature, it didn't like the light. We took our chances, picked our way out of the canyons, found a ranger station. Made up a story about a wild bear. They don't need to know the truth. Neither does anyone else. The agency patched me up, asked their usual questions. I gave them half-truths, enough to keep them satisfied without revealing the scale of the thing out there. Sarah vanished. Smart move. Best to make a fresh start after something like that. I've healed, mostly. The scars itch sometimes. Remind me. There are dark corners of this world where the maps end, where things that shouldn't exist still lurk and hunt. The agency wants me on another assignment. Up in Alaska this time. I've got no choice, really. Out there, the monsters have different names, different forms. But that hunger in the darkness, that's always the same. I'm Richard. My breath fogged the air around me as I stepped out of the van and onto a desolate sandy beach in Montauk, New York. I was working with a specialized task force, tracking down and hunting monsters that threatened our society. Our team consisted of Sarah, an intelligent analyst, and Jack, who knew perfectly how to handle any weapon in any situation. We were on a secret mission handed to us by our higher-ups that had me feeling quite skeptical of our world's hidden dangers. The sun was sinking behind the tree line, casting dancing shadows across the sand as Richard spoke in hushed tones. So, we're here because of reports about missing persons and some ferocious attacks on locals. Sarah added to what Jack said. Yeah, this is not the first time something like this happened. Remember Cincinnati? Jack chuckled at that mention. How could I forget? That time was crazy. I wiped beads of sweat forming on my forehead, thinking about my upcoming wedding anniversary. I missed spending time with my lovely wife and two amazing kids back home. Silence enveloped us for a moment until we heard footsteps coming from the brush nearby. As we approached the thicket, we found traces of claw marks through the undergrowth. The scratches were uneven, suggesting a creature unlike any we've encountered before, a grotesque animalistic predator that had been attacking locals. We tried to piece together what might have occurred here. To our surprise, Sarah discovered an abandoned campsite, smothered campfire ashes still emitting a faint smell of smoke and belongings strewn about. We should examine those, Richard said as he inspected them closely. Our attempt to call for help was hindered by terrible signal reception in the area. In minutes, it became evident that whatever had killed the occupants of this campsite possessed immense strength and brutal determination. Jack tensed up before turning to me and inquiring, If we decide not to run right now, will you have my back? With a wink. Of course, 
I assured Jack firmly. Our team continued onward, led by the abomination's trail of destruction. The sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky dark hues and casting twisted shadows that only managed to heighten my unease. Soon, we stumbled upon a gruesome sight. A mutilated body was lying in a pool of congealing blood. Jack quickly grabbed his camera to document the scene while Sarah searched for any clues that might point towards the creature. Then, we heard a guttural snarl behind us. My heart raced as I slowly turned around to confront the terror I had only imagined before. Its eyes burned furiously, fangs protruding menacingly from rotten gums. It stood on its muscular hind legs as if mocking our feeble human forms and covered in ragged fur matted with dirt and blood. The creature lunged forward, and we barely had time to react. Richard grabbed a nearby stick, brandishing it like a makeshift weapon. Sarah was already looking for a way out, her eyes scanning the terrain for escape routes. As the creature snarled and advanced, I tried dialing 911 on my phone but managed only intermittent beeps, indicating a weak signal. Guys, I think now's our best chance. Sarah called, pointing towards a narrow path that seemed to lead towards higher ground. We didn't need any more encouragement. We all bolted in the direction she indicated. As we stumbled through the underbrush, looking over our shoulders at the monstrous being pursuing us, Jack tripped on a tree root. He yelled out as he crashed to the ground. No! I cried, reaching for him. But before I could help him up, the unspeakable creature was upon him. Its powerful jaws clamped down on his leg as he screamed in agony. There was no time to save him. Jack's screams echoed through the forest. We have to keep moving! Richard grabbed my arm, pulling me away from the gruesome sight of our friend being mauled by the monster. Tears streaming down my face, I allowed myself to be prodded forward. We ran without looking back until we came across a small cabin hidden deep in the woods. The door was unlocked and creaked open with ease. Relief washed over us as we locked ourselves in. What do we do now? I asked between gasps of air. We can't wait here forever, Sarah replied quietly. Richard nodded solemnly. We need to alert someone about what's happening and bring people here who can deal with that thing. He stared at all of our phones sadly. None of them had any reception inside the cabin either. An idea struck me. Maybe there's a landline. We searched the cabin hastily, feeling a mixture of hope and desperation. To our immense relief, we found an old landline phone hanging on one wall. I hesitated before picking it up, remembering Jack's last moments. As I dialed 911, my hands shook uncontrollably. The operator answered promptly, and I relayed everything we had witnessed as calmly as I could, from the abandoned campsite to the monstrous creature attacking locals, leaving out no detail. The operator assured us that help was on its way and advised us to stay put in the cabin until their arrival. Hours passed and fear gradually gave way to exhaustion. We sat around a makeshift fire we had built inside the cabin, holding on to each other for comfort. When we heard distant sirens, relief flooded through us. Our ordeal would soon be over. The police arrived at the cabin with a team of armed officers prepared to confront any threat imaginable, but none of them had ever encountered a beast like this one before. They listened intently as we recounted our nightmarish experience and took detailed notes. Fortunately, they were equipped with tracking equipment that allowed them to pinpoint the general area where the creature might be hiding. As they prepared to hunt it down, we were taken back to town under guard. During our return journey, Sarah couldn't help but speculate. Could it have been some kind of animal that somehow mutated or evolved in some bizarre way? 
There have been cases of creatures developing strange adaptations because of environmental factors. I couldn't help but shudder at the thought. It didn't feel natural in any sense but knowing there was potential scientific explanation did offer a tiny speck of comfort. We later learned that the police tracked down and killed what they called an unknown species similar to a bear or big cat. It wasn't ordinary. Its fur was denser and darker than anything they'd seen before. Officials closed off the area as biologists and researchers swarmed to analyze the remains of the frightening creature. The trauma our group had faced changed us forever. We mourned Jack and found solace in remembering all the good times we had shared with him. Unlike many mysteries, there were no poetic answers or revelations, only fragmented theories. We were left with unsettling questions about what that creature was, where it came from, and whether there may be more of them out there, lurking in the shadows. It all started with an old college buddy, Declan. Always one for crazy weekend plans, even now with both of us settled into regular lives and nine-to-fives. This time... He wanted to check out Sequoia National Park in California. The giant trees, the remoteness, all of it. Me, I figured why not. I'm Jason, by the way, software engineer and definitely a creature of habit. A weekend in the great outdoors seemed harmless enough. Besides, he had this friend with a cabin right outside the park. His friend, Brianna, picked us up from the airport. Turns out the cabin was way farther in than either of us expected. An older A-frame tucked amongst dense pines, nestled against the steep hillside. Brianna had to use her ancient four-wheel drive just to tackle the narrow road. The farther we went, the quieter it got. My cell went dead miles ago. A little disconcerting, yeah, but something about the pure quiet felt good, too. A nice reset from the digital world. Next morning, we did a short hike near the cabin. Nothing serious, just one of the less trafficked trails to get familiar with the area. Brianna pointed out all kinds of stuff I wouldn't even have noticed. Paw prints scat. Normal hiker things, I guess. That afternoon, as the light waned, Declan got the itch to venture further. We took a dirt track that snaked around some old mines, following maps Brianna had given us. All good fun, if a little creepy, those deserted mine shafts gaping from the hillsides. We kept making dumb jokes about horror movies, getting bolder as we wound farther down the winding trail. It started with the noise. Like branches breaking, then the scrape and thud of something large. The smell was next, wet fur and decay, thick enough to cut through the cool air. Then, an ear-splitting roar echoed through the trees. All that bravado went right out of us. We started scrambling back toward the mine. Declan tripped, and suddenly that thing, whatever it was, crashed out of the undergrowth. I swear, even at fifteen feet I barely registered its form. Huge covered in ragged fur, eyes like cold embers. There was another snarl, blinding speed, and the world exploded. Declan went down, just vanished amongst the pines. Brienne yelled for him, staggered over. That's when I saw the blood spattered across the rocks and leaves, and a chunk of, of deck mangled among it. Shock froze me as that huge shadow reared up again. Brianna was screaming, running blind at that point. She wasn't going to make it. My feet finally started moving, but not following her. Instead, I dove straight for the old mining shaft. A split-second decision, and somehow it paid off. Brianna was still stumbling as the shadow barreled into the open with a deafening bellow. She screamed, not even five feet between her and those gaping jaws, 
Eyes that held no humanity, no emotion. Just hunger. Then she vanished with a bone-shattering crack. Silence fell with the last of the echoes. Inside the mine, it was pitch black. The smell of dust and damp earth mixed with a deeper metallic tang I knew was blood, hers. And the sense it would find me somehow, snuffle me out like it did them, left me gasping, scrambling with numb fingers for my lighter. Just a flicker of light to orient myself in the blackness. My hand hit something. Cold metal. An abandoned ladder, maybe? That's all I remember thinking before that monstrous roar broke the air, shattering my eardrums, echoing right outside the mine shaft. I was certain it knew. Hours? Days? I lost track down there. I heard it digging, scrabbling outside, then that horrifying snuffling noise almost at the opening itself. But in the end, it vanished back into the trees, its bellows fading. When I finally crawled out, it was nightfall. Brianna's truck was a wreck, mangled and flipped into the ravine. No sign of my friends. I followed the path back to the cabin, stumbled through the door in the pre-dawn light. I tried to phone. No signal, even if I knew what to say. I told myself they could still be alive, injured out there. They had to be. A few weeks later, a ranger found me still near the cabin, muttering and half-starved. The news reported it as an animal attack, mountain lion possibly. But even after those stories of disappearances in the national parks, even with the images of those huge tracks they found near the cabin, no one suspected what really lurks in the woods. Bigfoot, they say. I don't know about that. All I know is something still howls out there at night. Some days, I think I never actually escaped that mine. My name is Ellis Carver, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003, out in Olympic National Forest, Washington State. Been a ranger all my life, just like my dad and his dad before him. I know these woods like the back of my hand. Seen plenty of things tourists never will. Bears, bobcats, even the odd wolf passing through. Nothing ever truly dangerous, though. At least, not until that day. Now, this part of the forest is remote. We're talking no cell service, barely a signal for the radio. That's why my partner and I mostly stick together on patrol, especially if there's been a report of trouble. That morning was one such case. A group of campers hadn't made their scheduled check-in. Could be nothing, but it's our job to investigate. My partner's Dale Flynn, a good guy, bit of a jokester, but knows his stuff too. We hike in, following the trail to their last known campsite. Place is empty, tents still set up. No sign of a struggle, no trash left behind like a bear got into their things. Just gone. That's when we start getting a bad feeling. Dale suggests we split up. Cover more ground. I don't like it, but he's right. We agree to stick within shouting distance and check in over the radio every twenty minutes. We head out, me going deeper into the trees, Dale circling wide towards the south. It's slow going, terrain full of brush and fallen logs. I'm calling out for the missing campers, half expecting them to wander out of the bushes, confused and hungover. An hour passes and the hairs on the back of my neck start to prickle. Too quiet. No birdsong, no squirrels rustling in the leaves. Even the wind seems to have died. And Dale, he hasn't answered a radio check in a while. I try again. Dale? Come in, Dale. Over. Static crackles back. I break into a cold sweat. 
That sinking feeling in my gut intensifies. Something's wrong. I shout his name, my voice cracking in the unnatural silence. Nothing. Then I see it. A flash of movement up ahead through the trees. A figure, tall and hunched over. At first, I think it's just Dale. I move closer, calling his name again. But as the figure steps into a patch of sunlight, I freeze. This ain't Dale. It ain't even human. The thing is massive, at least seven feet tall. Covered in thick, dark fur, arms so long they almost drag on the ground. But it's the face that haunts me. Like a man, but twisted. Huge jaw jutting out, filled with yellow teeth. The eyes, small, black, glinting in the dim light. Intelligent. It notices me, lets out a low growl that rattles my bones. I try for my radio, but my fingers fumble. The thing lunges, moving with impossible speed for something its size. I trip, scramble backwards on the damp earth. I see a flash of claws and then pain. White hot, searing pain across my chest. It roars, a sound that's both animal and something far, far worse. I try to scream, but all that comes out are choked gurgles. The creature looms over me, reeking of rotten meat. It raises a massive paw, the claws glistening in the half-light. My time is up. I close my eyes, bracing for the end. And then, gunshot. The report echoes through the trees, and the creature jerks back with a snarl. I open my eyes. There's Dale, standing a dozen feet away, rifle raised. Another shot rings out, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roars in fury, then turns and bolts into the undergrowth, disappearing with shocking agility. Dale rushes over, dropping to his knees beside me. I try to speak, but blood bubbles from my mouth. He shakes his head, face pale. Ambulance is on the way, Ellis. Just hang on, he says, but I know we both hear the lie. I look up at the canopy of trees overhead, dappled sunlight filtering through. Such a beautiful place to die. I feel a wave of darkness wash over me, and my vision starts to fade. Dale's voice sounds far away now. Then faintly I hear it. A rustling in the bushes. Branches snapping. The patter of heavy footsteps closing in. Dale doesn't seem to hear it at first. His eyes are focused on me, pleading. But then his head whips around, and his expression shifts to horror. Ellis! Close your eyes! Don't look! He yells. There's a tremor in his voice, the kind I've never heard from him. I don't have the strength to obey, but I hardly need to. The creature bursts out of the undergrowth, a blur of fury. It doesn't go for me, though. Dale fires his rifle again, a desperate shot that goes wide as the creature barrels into him. They hit the ground with a sickening thud, Dale's scream cutting short. It's a blur of fur and teeth and blood. Dale thrashes, manages to throw a punch, but it's like a mosquito against a buffalo. The creature raises him off the ground one-handed, then slams him against a tree. There's the sound of bone snapping, and Dale goes limp, eyes wide and staring at nothing. Pure animal instinct kicks in then. No thought, just move. I push myself up, the pain in my chest beyond description. The creature is occupied, ripping and tearing at Dale's lifeless body. I stumble a couple of steps, reaching for my pistol where it fell, then I'm falling. My legs give out. I hit the damp ground, and that's when I see it, a thick branch ripped from a sapling. It's long, sharp at the broken end. A weapon if I'm desperate enough. The creature turns, a snarl curling its lips back from those bloody teeth. It sees me, registers that I'm still a threat. 
or maybe it just wants more. I know I have seconds, maybe less. It charges, a terrifying sight. But I'm not helpless anymore. With an agonized grunt, I push myself onto one knee, raising the broken branch like a spear. The creature's almost on me, the stench of it overpowering, its monstrous eyes filled with single-minded hunger. Then, it impales itself on the branch. The momentum carries it forward, the sharp point ripping through its chest and out its back with a wet, tearing sound. Its roar morphs into a surprised gurgle. I fall back again, the effort nearly bringing me unconscious. The creature thrashes against the branch, but it's a mortal wound. It collapses next to me, twitching and choking on its own blood. Then it lies still. Its small, dark eyes stare blankly at the sky. I did it. I don't know how, but I did it. But then, from deeper in the trees, there's another sound. A long, mournful howl, answering the first roar. And then another, closer. And another. Too many to count. Panic floods me anew. Dale's wrong. I'm not going to make it. Blackness threatens to consume me. I fight it, scrambling, crawling, dragging myself along the forest floor. My breaths are ragged, my cries for help barely whispers. I have no idea where I'm going, just the instinct to get away, to put distance between myself and the monsters that will soon be here. The pain fades in and out. I feel the cold earth beneath my fingers, smell the rich scent of decaying leaves. Then I see it. A flicker of light up ahead. The forest opens up, and there, a road. It's small, more of a gravel track than a proper road, but salvation just the same. I crawl towards it, fueled by sheer, desperate hope. I collapse at the edge of the gravel, and I don't have the energy to do more. Everything is dim, vision blurring again. Then headlights. A car is coming, jolting along the uneven path. I try to shout, to wave, but all I can manage is a feeble croak. The car stops. Doors slam, and there are voices. Concerned voices asking if I'm hurt. My blood-soaked ranger uniform is answer enough. Someone calls for help a voice trembling on a cell phone. It's going to be all right, they say. Help is on the way. I want to believe them. But I also hear the rustle of leaves in the forest, the snapping of twigs. They're coming closer. The headlights illuminate the tree line, casting long, sinister shadows. I try to tell them to get back in the car to run. My mouth works but nothing comes out. A dark shape emerges from the woods, then another, and another. Small eyes glint back at me in the harsh glare of the headlights. The people with me gasp in fear. One of them starts to scream. I close my eyes. I don't want to see what happens next. I wake up in a hospital bed. Clean sheets, the smell of disinfectant. My head is pounding and my chest feels like it's on fire, but I'm alive. Alive, but not alone. Janice, my friend from the ranger station, sits by my bed. There are dark circles under her eyes. She forces a smile, but it trembles as she reaches for my hand. They found you on the side of the road, she says, her voice thick. A couple of hikers. You were barely conscious. Dale. Dale didn't make it, Ellis. The news hits me like a physical blow. Grief and guilt wash over me in a numbing wave. She talks about the rescue team that went in, about how they found Dale's body, and what was left of the creature I killed. There are more questions, so many questions. What was it? How many are there? Why? The doctors and the police come asking me to recount everything. I do, mechanically, not believing my own words. 
They nod, jot things down. They reassure me that the area is closed off, that they're investigating. But there's a glint in their eyes, a skepticism. I know what they're thinking. Trauma victim, making up a wild story to cover what really happened to his partner. I'm released from the hospital a week later. There's a small memorial service for Dale. Afterwards, I go back to my cabin, the one I was living in before all this. I should feel safe there, but I don't. The trees stare at me accusingly through the windows. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind is a potential monster lurking at the edge of my awareness. I try to get back to work, to routine. But it's impossible. The rangers look at me with pity, like I'm a ticking time bomb. They whisper when I'm not around. Out in the woods, every shadow, every snap of a twig sends a jolt of terror through me. I jump at every sound, gun always in hand, sleep in impossible luxury. The nightmares come. Vivid, horrifying dreams of the creature, of Dale's death. They replay over and over, a torture without end. I start to drink. It's the only way to dull the pain, to stop the relentless churn of fear and guilt in my gut. They let me go, of course. Say it's best for all concerned. I don't fight it. I barely acknowledge it. Life fragments. I drift from town to town, taking odd jobs, never staying anywhere too long. The bottle is my constant companion. The only faces I trust are at the bottom of a glass. And all the while I hear them. The rustle in the bushes, the low growl from the shadows, the echoing howls in the dead of night. I know they're out there, lurking in the wild places. Waiting. Watching. And part of me waits, too, for the day the bottle isn't enough, the day I finally meet one of those creatures again, and the nightmare ends for good. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me on July 4, 2006. I've been a ranger with the Forest Service for longer than I care to admit. Mostly, the job's about keeping an eye on trail conditions, busting illegal campsites, the kind of stuff folks might take for granted. But out here in the remote stretches of the Idaho backcountry, well, you see things that don't always end up in the official reports. That summer had been a scorcher, the woods tinder dry and crackling underfoot. I was heading alone to check out smoke reports by an old fire lookout tower near the Selkirk Mountains. Routine, usually. But the fire season, it was turning nasty, and a bad blaze could tear through those forests with terrifying speed. Got to the trailhead just before noon. Sun beat down mercilessly, making the air shimmer. The usual crowd of holiday hikers was absent, smart of them, considering the heat and the fire risk. Seemed I had the whole mountain to myself. Reckon that was a mixed blessing. If something did go wrong, I was a long way from help. Still, duty called. I filled my water canteen, shouldered my pack, and headed up the trail. Didn't take long for that sense of unease to prickle the back of my neck. Wasn't just the heat making me edgy. Something about the forest felt wrong. The wildlife was missing. No birdsong, no squirrels rustling in the underbrush, even the buzz of insects faded out the deeper I went. Just an oppressive kind of silence. By late afternoon, I was closing in on the lookout tower. The smoke had been a false alarm, likely another hiker being careless with their campfire. But that didn't explain the growing dread coiling in my gut. Then I found the signs. First, there were the prints. Massive things, way too big for a bear, sunk into the dried mud by a stream. The shape was all wrong, claws longer than my hand, 
a heel pad that didn't belong to any animal I recognized. Whatever made those prints, it walked on two legs. Then the trees. Thick gashes raked through the bark, higher up than even a grizzly could reach standing on its hind legs. And a few thick strands of coarse, dark hair snagged in one of the gashes. Sent a shiver down my spine. The lookout tower was just ahead. It was an old wooden thing perched on a rocky outcropping, offering panoramic views of the surrounding peaks. A good place to spot fires, also a good place to get cornered. I crept closer, rifle at the ready. If a bear had gone rogue, if some poacher was up here causing trouble, this was where I'd find them. But what I found chilled me far more than any man or ordinary beast. The tower's base was splattered with something dark and sticky, blood. A ripped piece of bloody denim lay by the wooden ladder. The scent of copper and something far fouler hung heavy in the air. And in the dirt around the tower were those massive footprints again. Slowly, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. I circled the tower. The blood led up the ladder, towards the observation deck. I didn't want to see what was up there, didn't want to confirm what my gut already screamed at me. But sometimes with this job, there's no walking away from the ugly truth. I took the ladder rungs one at a time, hand tight on the splintery wood, rifle ready to bring up. The breeze had picked up, carrying a fresh wave of that fowl rotten meat stink with it. I reached the top and steeled myself to look. My first thought was there had been a struggle right out of some nightmare. Blood smeared the wooden planks, bits of what looked like torn clothing clung to rusty nails. But there was no body. Just an overturned camping chair, a scattered map, and the remnants of what must have been a hastily abandoned meal. Then I saw it, crouched in the far corner of the deck. At first, I mistook it for a shadow, just a trick of the fading afternoon light. But then it moved. It was like no creature I'd ever encountered. Humanoid, in a grotesque kind of way, but far too tall, close to seven feet even in its hunched posture. Lean and muscled, covered in patchy black fur, with a narrow elongated skull that sloped into a wolfish snout. But those eyes, they were worst of all. Small, yellow, and burning with a hunger that was primal yet cunning. It let out a low, menacing growl, bearing needle-like teeth. Then, without warning, it sprang. The thing was on me in a heartbeat, a blur of claws and teeth. I fired off a wild shot, more of a reflexive jerk than anything aimed. The bullet went wide, tearing into the rotting wood of the railing. Snarling, the creature batted my rifle aside with a strength that sent the weapon flying from my grip. I stumbled backwards, tripping over the discarded camping chair. It lunged at me, claws outstretched to rip. Pure instinct took over. I flung myself over the railing. It was a desperate, stupid move, a good fifteen-foot drop to the rocky ground below. But it was also, I realized too late, exactly what the creature wanted. I hit the earth with bone-jarring force. The impact knocked the wind out of me, stars bursting in my vision. Pain shot up my leg definitely sprained, maybe worse. The creature landed nimbly beside me, a dark shadow against the fading sunlight. It stalked towards me, a predator savoring its cornered prey. There was nowhere to run, no way to defend myself. This was it. I was going to die up here, torn to pieces by this, this monster from a nightmare. Adrenaline and raw terror gave me one last surge of desperate energy. Ignoring the screaming pain in my leg, I half-crawled, half rolled towards the base of the tower, fumbling for the discarded rifle. The creature closed in fast. Too fast. Saliva dripped from those horrific jaws. I managed to grab hold of the rifle stock, yanked it close, 
just as the thing lunged. My vision blurred, my arms shook with the effort of bracing myself, and the world exploded in noise. I'd fired blind, not expecting to hit anything. But the beast roared in sudden agony. My shot had caught it in the shoulder, ripping through flesh and muscle. Dark blood sprayed across the rocks. Stumbling back, it glared at me with pure malevolence, but there was a wary glint in those wicked eyes now, too. Another shot would surely finish it off. But fumbling with my busted leg, I knew I couldn't reload in time. The creature wasn't sticking around. It turned and bounded off into the trees, disappearing with unsettling grace despite its injury. I watched it go, chest heaving, heart pounding in my throat. It had gotten away, but for the moment, I was alive. Dragging myself back to the tower, I fumbled for my radio, voice shaking as I called for backup. They didn't believe me, the ranger who claimed to have seen Bigfoot— who somehow managed to shoot himself in the leg in the process. But they came anyway, a whole team of them, bristling with weapons and disbelief. They found no body at the tower, not human or otherwise. They found the blood, the ripped clothing, the signs of a struggle, and my rifle with one shell casing missing. The official verdict was a bear attack, victim unknown. I went on medical leave for my injured leg. Never did get credit for scaring off that bear, whatever it was. Folks whisper, up there in the high country, about the tower with bloodstains they couldn't wash clean, about the ranger who went a little crazy after what he saw. Maybe they're right. Sometimes, at night, I can still feel the burn of those yellow eyes on me can still smell the putrid stench of the creature's breath on my skin. The worst part is, I know it's out there. Injured, angry, and likely watching from the shadows. Maybe it's alone, or maybe there are more of them lurking in the vast wilderness. I went back a few times, unofficially. Took different trails, left offerings of food, Broken arrowheads, things I learned from old-timers who always said the deep woods held more than meets the eye. Seems crazy, I know, appeasing a monster. But out there, it's the unseen predators that are the most terrifying. Part of me hoped if I showed the creature respect, maybe it'd leave me and the others alone. But then again, part of me, part of me wanted a rematch. They shut down the lookout tower a few years back. Said it was unsafe, that the wood was rotting. But anyone who knows the area, knows that ain't the full story. They say it's best to leave some places undisturbed, let some mysteries stay mysteries. I tend to agree. Still, every time I drive past those mountains, part of me itches to go back, to follow those inhuman footprints into the wilds. See, the folks who call me crazy, they haven't felt the weight of that unnatural gaze. They don't know how quickly the world can flip into a darker place, where old maps fail, and the rules of predator and prey get rewritten. The wilderness, it's a beautiful place. But sometimes, there's more beauty in not knowing what lurks in the shadows. It keeps you humble, and it just might keep you alive. It happened a few summers back, not long after my divorce. Figured I needed a change, a break from city life, you know? My name's Caden, I do tech support back in L.A. Boring work, boring life to that point. So, I bought myself an old camper van, some hiking gear. Decided to make a road trip down through Oregon. Beautiful state. Redwoods, coastline quirky little towns. Just me and the open road, perfect for clearing my head. First stop was a town called Port Ford, right smack on the Pacific. Stayed at a campsite just outside town, right between the ocean and the trees. 
Plan to head a bit inland the next day. Get some real forest time. Early morning, I left the camper and set off into the woods with my pack. Water, sandwiches, the usual stuff. Trail wound upwards into the thick green hills, air cool and earthy. I felt lighter already. Must have been a few hours in when I came to a clearing by a creek. Perfect stop. I ate my lunch there, soaking up the quiet. That's when I heard the scream. Human, woman's voice, faint but definitely shrill with terror. Figured it must be an injured hiker or something. I hollered a, Hello? Back, then started in the direction the scream came from, picking up the pace. Found no sign of a trail, just thick underbrush. Still, that voice, couldn't leave it alone, could I? I pushed through the bushes, leaves whipping my face. No luck. Just as I was about to turn back, the screaming started again, but different. No longer that primal fear, but, like sobbing. I burst into another clearing, this one with a dilapidated cabin on a rise. The cries echoed off its old wooden walls. Now, here's where I should have listened to that small voice telling me to turn around. It felt wrong, that whole setting. I'm more keyboard clicks than bear wrestling, okay? But that woman sounded like she was in bad need of help. I called out again, approaching the cabin slowly. My footsteps must have alerted someone, because then a man's voice yelled. Stay back! I have a rifle! This brought me up short. My hands shot up, showing I was empty-handed. There was a crash. Maybe someone kicking over furniture inside? Stay clear, stranger! My girl, she's got some kind of sickness. Can't trust anyone but myself. I didn't quite buy the rifle threat. Sounded blustery but there was a raw edge to his words that chilled me. He clearly thought whatever she had might be contagious. My brain finally kicked in. Can't help you then. I shouted back, slowly retreating the way I'd come. Maybe try radioing park rangers. They deal with these sorts of things. As I backed away, there were muffled yells and more weeping through the trees. It tore at my gut, but hey... The smart move was to clear out. I made it back through the dense underbrush, found the main trail again. I must have jogged two miles straight before a wave of guilt rolled over me. There was an odd note in that whole encounter. Like the screams weren't quite right. That guy? I never actually saw him. Sure, maybe something was wrong with that girl, but what if he was holding her against her will? It seemed nuts, but it just nagged at me. By the time I reached my camper, it was sunset. My phone had no service there, of course. I debated trying to reach emergency services when I got back to Port Ford. But would they take me seriously? I had zero concrete evidence, just a hunch. Then, in a wave of stupidity, I thought maybe going back in the morning was an option. It sat wrong, though, I knew it. Like, whatever was down there wasn't just some backwoods sickness. I left at dawn. Got some snacks from the convenience store in Port Ford, and then aimed for a different park entrance further inland. I figured a forest that big. Whatever went down at that old cabin couldn't touch me now. The further I drove, the better I felt about running away. By lunch... I was feeling downright carefree. Had my windows open, some stupid pop song on the radio, basically back to being a typical clueless tourist. Then, at a scenic overlook of all places, I saw it out of the corner of my eye. A loping figure moving between the trees, gaunt, darkford, taller than any man should be. Then, the damn radio hiccuped and died. Car engine cut out too, just sputtered to a halt. Fear slammed into me harder than any airbag. The thing loped out onto the road. That's when I got a good look. 
antlers, but misshapen, more like gnarled branches jutting out of its skull. For matted and filthy. And this burning stare, the eyes like coals flickering. Its grin wasn't right, teeth bared as it shambled toward the car. It slammed a long hand against the glass. Crack lines sprouted across the window. I fumbled with the key, desperate to restart the engine. Finally, it sputtered to life. I gunned it in reverse and spun that camper around so quickly I practically got whiplash. The thing stood, watching me tear away on the road. Didn't stop driving until late that night. Sold the camper as soon as I reached a large city. Took a loss, didn't even care. Flew back to L.A., and haven't left since. I told the story to a few folks, got the expected pitying laughs. I started doing research afterward, trying to figure out what that thing could have been. That's when the stories about skinwalkers popped up. Made my blood run cold. Never gonna take myself on another grand, lone adventure, that's for sure. I'll leave the hiking to those survival TV show types. A while back, I got hired as a firefighter for Collier Seminole State Park. Loved being outdoors, loved that it felt like I was making a difference in the world. Back then, I was still young, kind of cocky, always ready with a joke, even in the tough spots. Name's Ryland, by the way. Ryland Knox. One shift, me and a couple of the older guys got called to set up fire control lines around a lightning strikeout in the swamp. Deepest summer the kind of heat that turns the air to soup. The park's a maze of mangrove forests and sawgrass, crisscrossed by old logging trails. We hauled gear for a mile or so, slicing through tangles of vines and swatting at clouds of mosquitoes. Sweat ran down my face and into my eyes, but I didn't complain. Older guys, they were tougher than nails, the sort you don't want to look soft around. We reached this clearing where a single pine tree had taken a direct hit. The smell of scorch would hung heavy in the air. We got to work digging trenches, soaking the ground with hoses to keep any stray sparks from catching. It was near sunset when we finished. We were heading out, and that's when I saw it, a body, lying half-hidden in the undergrowth. The older guys took one look and cursed— Radios crackling to life as the called and backup. By the fading light, I only really caught glimpses. Bloated, sunburned skin, shredded clothes, not an animal attack, that much was clear. It felt colder in that clearing, then, even with the fading heat. Something about the death was off, the body wrong somehow. I kept my mouth shut while the cops processed the scene. It was only on the way back to the station, listening to the senior firefighter curse and mutter, that I started to piece things together. See, he mentioned finding another body like that a year or so back. Same state, bloated, shredded. Official reports said it was animal attack, probably a gator. But the guy's eyes, there was something in them, something wary, a look that said he didn't believe it for a second. The night was hot and sticky, but a shiver ran down my spine. We hit the station, the lights jarring after the swamp's murky twilight. I couldn't get that image of the body out of my head, or the words the other firefighter had said. The rest of that summer, every time I went out on patrol, I had the sense of being watched. Like there was something just beyond my sight— in the shadows of the mangroves or the tangle of the cypress knees. I tried to shake it off, told myself it was my imagination, the heat messing with my head. Then came the night the fire watch alarm sounded. Wildfire, somewhere deep in the swamp. We piled into the trucks, sirens blaring, and cut a path through the wilderness. When we got to the source of the blaze— 
all I could do was stare. There wasn't much of a fire anymore. Just the smoldering remains of a few trees and a whole lot of ash. Ash that was shaped in a circle, too perfect to be natural. And in the center of that circle, another body. Same as the others. But this time, there were tracks. They led off into the swamp, not the clean prints of a gator or bear, but something narrow, elongated, the toes too long. The senior firefighters exchanged grim looks. They knew what I was slowly starting to realize, that we weren't dealing with any normal animal out there. A search party headed into the swamp, but they turned up nothing. After that, the stories started to filter through from other firefighters, from folks living on the edge of the park. There were whispers of things seen in the twilight, glimpsed out on the lonely trails. A tall, gaunt shape hunched just within the tree lean, its eyes gleaming in the dark. Didn't matter if folks believed me or not. I knew what I'd seen, that ring of ash, the shape of the tracks burned into my memory. Transferred out of that station, of course. We're closer to the city now, safer streets, safer buildings. But sometimes, when the nights are thick and the fog rolls off the water, and the street lamps cast long, twisting shadows, I think I hear a rustle just beyond my sight, like dry reeds parting. A lot of the locals have stories here, legends spun in smoky bars and hushed tones. Old tales that get passed down, about unnatural things lurking in the darkest corners of the swamp. Things with names like the Swamp Devil, the Night Walker. Things they say come calling when men tread where they don't belong. Maybe those stories are just stories. Or maybe there's a flicker of truth to them, a warning wrapped in shadow and myth. Couple of years later, I ran into one of the older firefighters from that station, the one who had told me about the other body. We had a few beers, got to talking, and I asked him, point blank, what he thought was out there. He got a faraway look in his eyes, took a long swig of his drink before he answered. Told me that his granddaddy, way back when, used to hunt deep in the Ten Thousand Islands. One night, out checking his traps, he claimed to have seen something step out of the mangroves. Not an animal, he'd sworn, not any kind of man either. He described skin the color of swamp water, long, ropey limbs, a face stretched wrong, and eyes shining with a cold hunger. His granddaddy had gotten out of there fast, and he never hunted those swamps again. The firefighter, his voice low, told me that he believed it. Believed that these weren't just all tales, that what we faced in the park wasn't an escaped animal or some crazed hermit. This was something older, wilder, something that had woven itself into the very roots of the swamp. I don't know for sure what stalks those shadowed trails part of me still wants to believe it's all hogwash, old wives' tales and too much moonshine. But then I remember that scorched circle, the tracks that led into the tangled heart of the darkness, and that gnawing feeling that something lurked just at the edge of my vision. Maybe the world is bigger and stranger than we like to admit. Maybe some places are meant to keep their secrets, and in the depths of the Everglades, where the sunlight can barely penetrate, there are things better left unseen. Those who know, know to tread carefully on that swampy ground, to keep a wary eye on the shadows. Because there's something else out there, watching and waiting, a creature of folklore and whispered warnings, forever bound to the wild, untamable spirit of the swamp. A year passed. Maybe two. Time blurred the edges. It started with a trip into the depths of the Everglades, a fishing expedition with a buddy of mine. Call me Cole. Cole Tanner. Back then, I was still into the kind of adventure that involved a cooler full of beer, a tackle box, 
and the vague hope of catching something bigger than a sunburn. Florida's wilder spots seemed like the place to go, and my friend Ezra knew every twist and turn of the glades from his old scouting days. Alligators and base, he promised. Maybe a big gar, too, if we're lucky. Lucky wasn't a word in my vocabulary. But we piled into his battered ford, and a hot morning found us puttering down a narrow canal in his old John boat. The motor coughed and wheezed, and the muddy water lapped at the decaying fiberglass. Cypress trees lined the shoreline, their branches draped with moss. I had a beer in my hand, and the whole setup seemed right to me. This is prime gator territory, Ezra said, his eyes scanning the tangle of roots. He wore camouflage shorts and a tank top showing off faded tattoos. You ever wrestle one? I chuckled, feeling the sun beat down in earnest. Nah, but my uncle did. Tore his arm off. He laughed, teeth flashing. Crazy old bastard. Conversation lulled. The air hung thick with humidity and the smell of stagnant water. The only movement was the dance of gnats around our heads and the occasional sputter from the outboard motor. That first glimpse, the shift in the murky water, a disturbance that wasn't the wake of our boat, my brain didn't even register it as danger. See that? Ezra's voice was a low hiss, his gaze locked somewhere to our left. I squinted. In the shadows beneath the cypress roots, something moved. A log? No. A ripple in the wrong direction, as if the water was pushed against the current. Slowly, as if the creature within was gauging us, a shape emerged. A head, smooth and elongated. Dark eyes the size of marbles glittered just above the water's surface. Holy hell, I whispered. I thought of gators, of course. But this was wrong. Too long, too slender. The angle of the head as it rose out of the water looked more like a snake, a massive water snake, than a reptile. And with a burst of motion that left the water churning in its wake, it slithered from its hiding spot. For a moment, the sheer mass of it, perhaps twenty feet uncoiled, paralyzed me. But fear took over as it began to circle the boat its beady eyes never leaving us. Motor! Ezra fumbled with the starter, his hands shaking. The engine roared to life, then choked and died again. Panic surged through me, a sour taste at the back of my throat. Paddle! I shouted, but before either of us could grab the oars, the creature attacked. It reared out of the water, a dark, glistening form. I caught a glimpse of teeth, rows of them, serrated like knives, and a wide, gaping maw. The John boat tilted dangerously as the creature crashed against its side, its thick body slamming into us. Ezra shrieked and tumbled backwards into the muddy water. The monster thrashed, its tail smashing the coolers and sending our gear flying. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding. Ezra! I screamed, reaching for him in the churning water. But he was already gone, vanished beneath the murky surface. The creature was back, its gaze fixed on me. There was an intelligence in those eyes, a cold calculation that chilled me to the bone. It wasn't hunger I saw there, but something more twisted, as if it enjoyed the hunt. Before I could react, it surged towards me again. I dived, the rough fiberglass scraping my bare legs. I hit the water with a gasp, the cold shock stealing my breath. Frantically, I swam beneath the surface, half-blind in the gloom. I could feel the creature's movement, a powerful ripple that churned the water. I could hear it, a low, hissing sound that vibrated through my bones. Bubbles escaped my lungs, and I was desperate. Kicking wildly, I broke the surface and gulped in a ragged breath. 
the creature was gone. Ezra? I croaked, my voice breaking in a sob. I scanned the murky water frantically. There was nothing. No sign of my friend, no trace of what had taken him. Then, bobbing amongst the floating detritus, I saw his camouflage hat. I swam towards it, a knot of dread tightening in my stomach. I clung to the wreckage of the John boat. The sun beat down mercilessly, and the air throbbed with the whine of mosquitoes. I was alone. There was no sign of the creature. The only sound was the soft lapping of the water and my own ragged sobs. Despair settled like a weight over my shoulders. When survival instincts kicked in numbly, I began to piece together makeshift paddles from the shattered remains of the boat. I moved mechanically, not knowing where I was going or how I would explain this to anyone. Ezra, what was left for his family? My own guilt was a crushing burden. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the swamp in hues of blood orange, I still drifted. Movement in the distance snapped me out of my despairing haze. The creature broke the surface, gliding through the water with impossible speed. I dropped the makeshift paddle, my hands shaking. It was coming back. My voice cracked as I mumbled prayers I hadn't thought of since I was a child. But when it lunged, I found a desperate burst of strength. I dove off the upturned boat with a splash, swimming underwater as long as I could before I surfaced, gasping for air. That's when I saw it. Not the creature, but a distant glow through the tangle of trees. A light, promising civilization. I didn't know what I would say, or who I could tell, but I had to get there. I struck out, my muscles burning, every stroke fueled by desperation and the memory of Ezra's terrified eyes. The creature surfaced again, its dark form slicing through the water in pursuit. It was toying with me, I realized, playing a cruel game. And it could do this all night. I could barely lift my arms as I finally reached a tangle of mangrove roots and hauled myself up onto a sliver of dry land. My legs trembled, and I collapsed onto the muddy ground, sobbing in exhaustion. But there was no time to feel sorry for myself. I dragged myself further in, clawing my way through a seemingly endless labyrinth of roots and mud. My clothes were torn, my body bruised and bleeding. But I kept moving. I forced myself to my feet, stumbling onwards, driven by a blind, desperate instinct to live. Hours later, or maybe it was minutes, time twisted out of shape in the dimness of the swamp, I emerged at the edge of the Everglades. There was a road. Hitchhiking with blood-soaked clothes and wild eyes wasn't the easiest experience of my life, but eventually, a grizzled truck driver took pity on me. They found my battered John boat a few days later. No trace of Ezra, of course, or of the creature. There was a police report, an awkward interview, stares of disbelief. They labeled me a survivor of a freak boating accident. I never went back to the Everglades. I barely go near any large body of water, frankly. My nightmares still take me back to that murky water, to those cold eyes, to the teeth that snatched Ezra away in an instant. They tell me stories, of course, about the skunk ape sightings, the mythical swamp creature that lurks in the depths of the glades. Those beady dark eyes match my own in the mirror these days. Do I believe it? I don't know. All I know for sure is that there are things out there, hidden creatures. And sometimes, they hunt us for their cruel sport. October 17, 1997 Always been a bit of a loner, 
so when I got the opportunity to buy a chunk of land way out in the Gila wilderness in New Mexico, I jumped at it. Call me Lucas. Ex-military, saw enough of the world to know I preferred the quiet life. Built myself a small cabin, did some odd jobs for supplies kept to myself. Figured a man could find peace and solitude out there. Until the killing started. First, it was a rancher on the edge of the wilderness, found torn apart near his livestock pens. Sheriff chalked it up to a bear attack gone wrong, but folks around here knew better. Something was out there hunting, something that left tracks bigger than any bear I'd ever seen. Then old Elias, a prospector who lived up in the hills, vanished without a trace. Found some of his belongings scattered by a creek, stained dark with blood. Whispers turned to fear, fear to a sort of grim determination. This was our home, and we weren't about to be driven off by some thing. We started hunting it, organizing armed patrols through the woods. I went with them a few times, my military training kicking back in. Never saw a hide nor hair of the creature, but the woods felt off, oppressive, like we were being watched by something unseen. One day, I was out hunting for deer to stock up for winter when I saw it. Crouched on a ridge, watching me. It was tall, too tall to stand fully upright, with leathery skin stretched tight over bone. Its limbs looked too long, bent at unnatural angles, and its head was a wolf skull stretched and pulled into a monstrous parody, rows of jagged teeth bared in a snarl. But the eyes, those yellow eyes held a chilling intelligence. We stared at each other for a long, horrifying moment. Then it uncoiled, moving with impossible speed, and vanished into the dense trees. I bolted back to my cabin, heart thundering in my chest, and loaded every firearm I owned. The siege lasted for hours. I heard it circling the cabin, raking its claws against the walls, its ragged breathing mingling with the howling wind. I huddled on the floor, rifle clutched in my trembling hands, whispering old prayers and willing the sun to rise. When dawn finally came, I cautiously peered out the window. The ground was ripped to shreds, and a dark stain marked the cabin wall where the creature had battered it. But it was gone. It could have torn me out and devoured me in seconds, but for reasons I couldn't fathom, it didn't. From that day on, I was never the same. Couldn't shake the feeling of being hunted, the knowledge that something monstrous lurked in the shadows just beyond my sight. After a month of sleepless nights and constant dread, I packed my things and left the wilderness, never looked back. Found a cramped apartment in a dusty border town. Hate the noise, the crowds, the constant feeling of being exposed. I keep a loaded shotgun by the bed, but I know deep down it would do no good if that thing ever found me again. Some nights, lying awake in the stale city air, I think I hear its snarl carried on the wind, and the scent of rot and damp fur tickles my nose. It knows where I am. It's only a matter of time until it comes for me. The locals where I lived had a name for it, the Skinwalker. They say it's a creature of Navajo legend, a shapeshifter filled with ancient malice. I don't know what to believe anymore. Only that pure evil has touched my life. That out there, in the vast untamed wilds, something waits in the darkness, forever hungry. August 21st, 1999. Wanted to get away from it all. The frantic pace of city life. The constant noise. The feeling of being just another cog in some giant, uncaring machine. Found a piece of land tucked into the Ozarks. Built myself a cabin. Figured I could live a simple, peaceful life out there. Call me Wyatt. Ex-Army Ranger. 
but you wouldn't guess that looking at me now, chopping wood in my faded flannel and worn jeans. First year went by quiet enough. Hunted, fished, got to know the rhythms of the woods. Then people started disappearing. Ezra, a grizzled old trapper who kept to himself, gone without a trace from his shack deeper in the hills. Couple hikers vanished from a popular trail. Search parties turned up nothing. Whispers started amongst the scattered folks out here. Wild hogs getting bolder, or maybe a mountain lion with a taste for human flesh. I tried to brush it off, but a sense of unease started to prickle at the back of my neck. Something wasn't right. Those disappearances felt different, too clean, too calculated. Then I found the deer carcass. Half-eaten, stripped of flesh in a way no predator I knew would do. And beside it, the tracks, larger than a bear's, with claws that looked longer than my damn fingers. That's when the dread settled deep in my gut. Something unnatural was out there. I started taking precautions, secured my cabin, kept my rifle loaded at all times. Nights were the worst. The woods seemed to go deathly still, and I'd swear I could hear ragged breathing, rustling footsteps just beyond the feeble ring of firelight. Finally, it came for me. Woke up to a noise like branches snapping. The full moon painted the clearing outside my cabin in an eerie silver glow, and that's when I saw it. Hunched by the tree line, it was easily eight feet tall, covered in matted fur. It had a wolf-like head, but twisted and wrong, its muzzle stretched out too long, full of gleaming teeth. The eyes, those damn yellow eyes burned with a hungry intelligence that made my blood run cold. I fumbled for my rifle, fired a shot that rang out in the night. The thing snarled, a bone-chilling sound, and bolted upright. For a terrifying moment, I thought I was dead. It charged, moving with blinding speed. The door splintered under its impact, and I barely scrambled out the back window. I ran for what felt like hours, the creature's ragged snarls and the crashing of its pursuit echoing through the trees. Finally, just when I thought I couldn't run another step, I stumbled onto a logging road, flagged down a passing truck. Didn't even look back at the tree line, just threw my pack into the truck bed and collapsed, gasping for breath. The trucker gave me a long, suspicious look but drove me to the nearest town. I reported the attack to the sheriff, some half-baked story about a bear gone rogue. He didn't buy it, but what could he do? I didn't stick around to find out. Never set foot in those woods again. Now I drift from one cheap motel to the next, always on the edge of town, where the darkness doesn't feel quite so vast and ancient. Every rustle of leaves sets my heart pounding. I catch glimpses sometimes, a hulking shape out of the corner of my eye, and the rotten stench of it wafts through my nightmares. City lights don't feel so bad anymore. At least the monsters here have human faces. Out there in the wild, lonely places, there are things far older and more terrible lurking in the shadows. I ran from it, but I don't think I'll ever truly escape. Maybe when it finally corners me, maybe then I'll find out what the locals call it. The Ozark Collar, or something older still. My name is Rhett Miller, and this happened to me in July of 1998, in Montana's Glacier National Park. Always had a thing for the mountains, even when I was a kid. After my stint in the Marines, the wide open spaces and quiet trails were just the medicine I needed. Got a job as a ranger, and Glacier became my backyard. It might sound cliché, but those mountains felt like home. One fine morning, I was heading out to do maintenance along the Grinnell Glacier Trail. It's a popular hike, 
and those boardwalks need constant upkeep, especially with the heavy summer foot traffic. I was whistling some old country tune, enjoying the cool air and bright blue sky, when I saw it, a mangled mess of fur and bone halfway up a slope. Not elk, not bear. I recognized those long, spindly legs. It was a deer, but it looked like it had been taken apart with surgical precision. I radioed for backup. Even after years on the job, you never got used to this kind of thing. As I waited, I noticed something strange about the ground surrounding the carcass. There were no paw prints, no drag marks. Whatever killed this deer didn't leave much evidence behind. When Deputy Lewis arrived, he looked just as puzzled as I felt. There was no sign of struggle, no blood spatter. This wasn't your usual predator attack. He swore it almost looked like the carcass had been dropped, from a hell of a height. We chuckled, probably just a bird that got too ambitious, right? Lewis and I made our way back down the trail, but the gnawing unease in my gut didn't fade. Then we heard the rustling, the sound of something large moving through the dense undergrowth uphill from us. My muscles tensed, this was no squirrel. Lewis glanced at me, his eyes wide. We didn't need to say anything. Back to back, I muttered. Weapons ready. We stood in the center of the trail, guns drawn, rotating slowly to cover all directions. The rustling grew closer, circling us. Lewis cursed under his breath. That was when it appeared. A monstrous figure emerged from the pines, towering over us. Its form was vaguely humanoid, but far too tall, with impossibly long, thin limbs. Its skin had a mottled, bark-like texture, and its head sat on a neck far too long for its body. The worst part were the eyes, large, black, and filled with a primal intelligence that made my blood run cold. This thing wasn't just hunting— it was observing us. We held our ground, trying to project some semblance of authority, but I felt like a rabbit caught in the headlights. My gut told me to make a run for it, but Lewis held up a hand. He inched his radio towards his mouth. Dispatch, this is Deputy Lewis. We have a situation at Grinnell Trailhead. Require immediate. The creature lunged moving with inhuman speed. In a flash, it was on Lewis, claws outstretched. It snatched him off his feet with terrifying strength. His scream was cut short, replaced by the wet, crunching sound of breaking bones. I stared in horror as it hoisted his lifeless body overhead and vanished back into the trees with a speed that defied all sense. Overwhelmed, I sprinted back toward the trailhead, my breath coming in ragged gasps. Branches whipped at my face, and the echo of the creature's inhuman shrieks seemed to follow me. I radioed for backup, my voice shaking. My description sounded half-crazed, tall, inhuman, impossibly fast. They thought it was the shock, the stress of seeing Lewis die like that. They send a chopper and a search party but I knew what was out there. There was no way they'd find it. By nightfall, they hadn't found a trace of the creature or Lewis's body. I sat numbly in the ranger station, official reports be damned. My supervisor offered me a stiff drink, tried to convince me it was a bear attack, maybe a freak accident. But I knew better. That look in the creature's eyes... I'd been around predators all my life, but that level of calculated malice was something else entirely. They told me to take time off, offered mandatory psych therapy, the whole nine yards. I took one look at that concerned shrink, his neatly pressed slacks and his soft white hands, and I knew he wouldn't understand. He couldn't. I walked out of Glacier the next day and never looked back took up odd jobs, drifting from one backwoods town to another. 
Even in crowded bars, I always sat facing the door, my back against the wall. The news became my worst enemy. Every few years, I'd hear whispers, hikers gone missing, hunters found torn to shreds, always in remote parts of the wilderness, always with the same, impossible lack of evidence. It followed me like a shadow. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was watching, waiting. One of these days, I'd slip up or get unlucky. Sometimes, under a full moon, I step out onto my porch. It faces the dense stretch of Arizona pines. Late at night, when the desert is dead quiet, I swear I hear a rustling coming from the tree line, just at the edge of the light. I always strain my eyes to see into the darkness, searching for those glowing orbs, that elongated silhouette, waiting, maybe even hoping for a final confrontation to put an end to this waking nightmare. I always believed the deep woods held secrets, the kind whispered about in the small hours at roadside diners but never taken seriously. I'm Cyrus Holloway, a park ranger patrolling the immense forests of the Olympic National Park. My days consist of ensuring hikers stay safe and nature remains undisturbed. It was during one of these routine patrols that my once firm grip on reality began to waver. I came across a scene that challenged my skepticism, a campsite torn asunder, tents shredded not by any bear or wolf I knew of. The metallic scent of blood hung heavily in the air, mingling with the earthy aroma of pine and soil. Nostrils flaring and senses on high alert, I scanned for survivors but found none, only belongings scattered like confetti after a morbid celebration. The nearest trailhead was miles away, and cellular signals were as scarce as honest politicians in these parts. No signals meant no easy call for help. We were warned during training to be self-reliant. Muffled by trees older than most cities, my shouts for anyone around echoed unanswered. Jensen Morelli, an occasional poacher with an ironically fervent sense of environmentalism, stumbled upon me investigating. What happened here? he asked, his eyes surveying the damage. I noticed his hand hover over the hunting knife at his belt, the familiar response to unexplained danger. Attack! I simply replied while gesturing towards what remained of the campsite. We agreed silently that notifying authorities was our next step, but when we approached my truck parked on a dirt road cutting through the lush underbrush, something felt off. There was a dent on the hood, substantial and unmissable, as if something had fallen, or jumped. That night at the station was when Patterson Beecham vanished. A rookie officer known for his quick wit and quicker trigger finger, he could have dialed for backup or run when he felt something off in those woods. But curiosity got the better of him, same as it did me. Though inexperienced, Patterson was sharp enough to notice oddities without articulating them into worldly fears. Together Jensen, myself, and two other rangers, Marlott Say and Roan Keating trekked back to where Beecham last reported over the radio. Darkness crept in early thanks to thick canopies overhead as dusk began its descent into night. It wasn't long before trails looked unfamiliar— Landmarks seemed to shift like ephemeral shadows flitting just beyond our torchlight's reach. We found Patterson's hat near a creek, not much but enough to stop Marla in her tracks. A sound erupted then, guttural and primal, unlike any cougar's scream or elk's bugle heard before in these parts. Instincts screamed run, yet our duty anchored us firmly. A silent agreement hung amongst us that retreat was not an option when someone stood missing. Roan raised his gun slowly towards where our collective gaze had fixated. Something moved between trees so fluidly it seemed to blend with moss and stone alike. Difficult to discern its shape, 
too large and misshapen to match anything readily recognizable from years working in these woods. Suddenly Marla fell forward, an unseen force knocking her down. Jensen rushed toward her aid firing wildly into the dark foliage where leaves rustled disclosing nothing significant, while Roan pulled her back to her feet checking for wounds but finding none only fear mirrored in her eyes reflecting ours alike. Panic set in for a fleeting moment. We huddled closer, three rangers armed with guns and flashlights, an accountant caught in a situation no ledger had prepared him for. We needed to make a decision. The silence was already stuffed with fear. Roan spoke first, firm voice undercut by the seriousness of our situation. We make for the ranger station. We radio for help, he said. Jensen nodded, checking his gun again loaded as if to reassure himself rather than provide an answer. I couldn't argue. Communication lines were our best shot. Marla was back on her feet now, but her fall left her shaken, bruises starting to form on exposed skin like a rough blueprint of an invisible assailant's touch. We formed a circle facing outwards and started moving, torchlight dancing eerily with each hurried step. The path towards safety seemed longer than any of us remembered. Glances fell behind often. None of us wanted to admit something might be trailing us its intent hidden in the brush. Then another roar shattered the strained quietude. It reverberated through the trees, causing birds to erupt into panicked flight above us. Leaves shook as if in horror at the sound. Not animal, not human, something else entirely. We broke into a run. The ranger station loomed ahead like salvation sculpted out of wood and stone when Marla screamed a true scream of pain this time. We spun around. Blood mixed with mud, a large gash cut across her leg like a grotesque smile. No creature in sight but its work unmistakable on her skin. Roan fashioned a tourniquet while Jensen scanned our perimeter with his gun ready but there was no following attack. We need to get her to safety, I urged, dread clawing up my throat. Roan nodded gravely and spoke into his radio with commands too calm for our circumstance. Ranger Station Echo requesting immediate assistance on Trail 7 Alpha. We have an injured party. A crackle then assent. Copy that echo. Help is en route. We barricaded inside the station after what felt like hours rather than minutes. Marla lay on a cot her breathing steady thankfully, but she needed professional medical attention fast. It wasn't long before shouts from outside heralded the arrival of backup and paramedics. As they tended to Marla and whisked her away back towards civilization and safety, we rangers exchanged looks that said everything our training taught us to never vocalize. This was beyond any natural explanation we could offer. Roan finally put it into words. Whatever did this wasn't any animal I've ever come across, he said heavily while looking out into the darkened woods that had just claimed one of our own under mysterious circumstances. Together we vowed never to speak of tonight officially. It would become another unexplained footnote in local history, perhaps. I stayed silent during debriefs. What could I say? A creature attacked us. They think panic bought on by Patterson's disappearance skewed my reality, but looking at each other's eyes, I saw a shared truth. Something moved out there between trees too elusive for light or bullets to catch. A villain merely assumed, never understood fully by those it terrorized nor by myself now thoroughly shaken beyond any accountant's composure. I never cared much for the limelight. The trees were company enough. Names like mine, Reuben Paxley, they don't exactly paint headlines in this line of work. I keep Big Sur's wooded expanse as my domain, where the redwoods stretch towards the heavens and the coastal air mixes with earth. 
on one such routine sweep, deep in those woods where sunlight hesitates to tread, I found belongings scattered without an owner in an abandoned campsite with clothes that looked forcibly torn, no sign of who they once draped. Not a lost hiker's usual trace. Trouble starts quiet here. A missed check-in, a boot print where no hiker should roam. These I can handle like clockwork. It was my rhythm until that day. Cresting the rise overlooking a tucked-away glen, I paused. My breath came steady. My heartbeat did not betray fear. Rangers don't rattle easy. But there lay something grisly before me, remains shaped by brutal purpose. A rigid cadaver stretched out beneath me, a tableau of violence amidst the ferns and fallen leaves. No animal I knew could craft such horror with teeth and claw alone. This was different, calculated in its brutality. I reached for my radio to call it in. Silence greeted me in return. The static whispered back empty threats as I recalled the misfortune of yesterday's dead zone discovery. Technology's reach was fickle among these ancient giants. I recalled words from my father. Always trust your eyes, Reuben. They'll tell you what's hidden beneath the veil. He too was a sentinel of the woods until breath escaped him one cold dawn. With evening shadows stretching their fingers across the scene, decision wound its inevitable path through my thoughts. Return for aid or venture onward after whatever performed this ungodly rite? The nearest ranger station was miles out, too distant to make it before nightfall. The glen ceased to be merely a place. It became a stark reminder of vulnerability under nature's indifferent gaze. Normal prey doesn't turn predator here. Nature follows an unwritten pact. Yet evidence of an aberration littered around me whispered tales of a hunter unlike any other, bones cleaned with precision alien to our fauna's messy table manners, marks on bark higher than any black bear would reach. Scuffs forming patterns in dirt telling of heavy lurkings and swift chases. Nearby trails beckoned me to follow this entity's shadow but prudence dug its heels deep. Uncertainties within me wrestled with duty etched by bloodline and badge alike. Knights and Big Sir aren't for pursuit but for silent homage to Dark's dominion. I turned back. The evening closed in, the woods went quiet, too quiet for comfort. The need to reach safety outstripped my resolve to stand guard over this solemn ground. I quickened my pace toward the station, heart pounding with a rhythm that matched my brisk steps. Upon reaching the clearing where the radio signal broke through the barrier of these ancient giants, I called in the rangers. This is Reuben. I gasped into the radio. Send back up to the glen, something out there. Hours dragged. Lights pierced through darkness as trucks approached. Rangers surrounded me, their faces etched with concern and curiosity. We found nothing, they reported after scouring the area. No tracks? None. And no sign of any creature big or small. Just silence and shadows. My mind raced but offered no answers. That night we set up camp, guarding what remained until dawn broke and reality returned to the realm of routine. Days passed. Nature reclaimed its rhythm. Hikers traversed trails and birds sang their hymns. But sundown brought unease as I patrolled near where I stood days earlier. A rustle caught my attention. A shadow moved with intent through thickets beyond natural speed, muscles rippling beneath dark fur eyes catching moonlight with a predator's gleam, a beast unlike any known wildlife. It struck before I could react, quick and silent as nightmare fuel. Rangers found me at daybreak, bloodied but alive barely, limping back with warnings on trembling lips about claws and teeth designed for stealthy slaughter. Words spread of an unknown danger lurking within Big Sur's embrace. Trails were closed, meetings held. The beast remained elusive, 
a shadow among trees too clever to be trapped by human hands or minds. In time, they moved on, not forgotten. The memory of those lost burned in our reticence to whisper of beasts, but accepted as another unexplainable enigma nature refused to unveil. I left the service soon after, scarred more by knowing such creatures walked amongst us than by physical wounds that healed with time. Silence now greets me willingly. A small house away from untamed wilds is my sanctuary. And so ends my watch, a sentinel no more, grateful each dawn for life's continuance in a world where hidden horrors prowl beyond light's reach and certainty's grasp. I had always found peace in the solitude of the Pine Barrens. As a park ranger, my name, Thomas Steckler, became synonymous with these woods. It was during a routine check near the old Franklin mine that I stumbled upon an unsettling find. A car, abandoned, windows frosted over from the inside. No tracks around it other than my own that strange, I thought. I radioed base with my findings. No response crackled through the static. Minutes turned to hours as I documented the scene, waiting for backup that never came. That's when I heard it, a subtle rustling not far in the brush, a sound out of place in the stillness of the forest. With training being my only companion, I approached cautiously. As day bled into dusk, Shadows played tricks on my eyes until they locked on a disturbance in the thicket. There, half buried beneath a pile of dead leaves, was a wallet belonging to one Jericho Luntz, a name unheard before today. But what sent a chill down my spine wasn't what I found but rather what found me, a glimpse of movement tailored by neither man nor known beast. I retreated to my truck before sundown and grabbed my shotgun, not standard issue but necessary around here. A chirp on the radio broke the silence. Help was delayed until morning due to unexpected road blockages. It wasn't long before dusk enveloped me and whispers turned to howls somewhere in the distance. Nightfall transformed those woods playing host to a series of chilling echoes and erroneous movements between trees I knew like the back of my hand. Yet there was something unfamiliar tonight. My breaths grew uneven as I glimpsed it, eyes reflecting moonlight like fogged mirrors, its stature inhumanly tall and gaunt, walking on what seemed too many jointed limbs, hidden mostly but occasionally caught in sparse moonlight. Nature seemed to hush around its presence. When daylight finally graced me again, I persisted through dense underbrush, following signs of havoc imprinted into the earth by something unrecognizable. Broken branches and impressions of unnatural feet led me toward an ominous conclusion. Something had taken Jericho from his car. This wasn't just another missing person's case. It felt different, sinister even as if whatever roamed these woods had now marked me too. My fingers tightened around my shotgun as I moved through increasingly unfamiliar terrain. Was this still my pine barrens? Every rational thought urged me toward retreat, and yet curiosity propelled me deeper into entangled woods where vegetation grew thick and wild. Then forearm deep in nettles did I find it a tuft of shirt fabric clinging desperately to brambles, identical to that which once covered Jericho's body. I edged back, clutching Jericho's shredded shirt. My mind raced for an explanation, something rooted in the natural world. The tuft of fabric was proof of violence, tangible, undeniable. No signal on my phone meant no calls for help. I was alone. I made the decision to return to what was left of Jericho's car. There, perhaps I could find something more to explain his disappearance. Each snap of a twig underfoot felt like an alarm bell as I trekked back, gun ready. What I found at the car's site unsettled me more, 
a fresh set of prints leading away from the vehicle into the forest depths. I followed, compelled by duty rather than desire. Hours passed. A trail of disturbed leaves and broken branches led me to a clearing where ambient moonlight revealed remnants of a struggle. Blood stained the ground but no body was present. It was then that I saw it again, the creature, feeding on something obscured by darkness. My finger tensed on the trigger of my shotgun but I held my breath instead. The creature paused and turned its head toward me, its eyes catching moonlight again in a frightening lure. It was impossibly tall and unnaturally poised on limbs that seemed both too many and too twisted for any known species. The sight of its elongated jaw working methodically through flesh sent shivers up my spine. I choked back any sound that threatened to escape from my mouth. It hadn't noticed me yet. Realizing this thing might be beyond any human intervention, I turned slowly, aiming for quiet retreat over confrontation. Each step away from the clearing felt heavier than the last. When I reached relative safety, I sprinted. As dawn broke, I burst into the local police station breathless with my report. But what was it? They asked after surveying Jericho's car and the scene in the clearing. I don't know, I admitted. But it's out there. They never found Jericho or identified whatever was responsible. Locals whispered about a beast in Pine Barrens, painting lore from blood and mystery. Yet as days slipped into routine once more, Jericho became another lost soul, a grim chapter closed with no epilogue written by those who remained behind. As for me, my once familiar woods now carry an undertone of fear, as if eyes watch from every shadow, and I avoid them when night falls. I remember stumbling upon the small, isolated town of Silver Cove during my road trip across the country. As an aspiring writer with an interest in true crime, I had always been drawn to the smaller, lesser-known places that often harbored dark secrets. My name is Jasper Clemens, and I had no idea what was waiting for me in this seemingly innocent town. Upon my arrival, I immediately noticed the friendly nature of the locals who introduced me to their hidden gem of a diner. As I enjoyed a surprisingly scrumptious burger, I found myself engaged in a conversation about strange occurrences that have been plaguing Silver Cove. According to Thomas Harp and Cynthia Hollis, a series of strange incidents had recently struck panic in the community. Each time someone went missing, their body was discovered mutilated beyond recognition or their remains scattered across the surrounding wilderness. I couldn't shake my sense of unease, which only grew when I met Abigail Pritchard. She had been researching these events ever since her cousin, Nelson Pritchard, became one of the victims. Together we decided to investigate further and arranged to meet at Thomas Harp's cabin located at the edge of a thick forest that bordered Silver Cove. Underneath a pitch-black sky lit only by the moon, we arrived at Thomas's cabin. Before entering, we gathered flashlights, warm clothing and our concealed weapons, not knowing what we might face ahead. With each step deeper into the forested darkness, my pulse quickened as adrenaline coursed through me. As we made our way through the trees which loomed menacingly above us like silent witnesses to countless horrors that occurred within these woods that we stumbled upon a shallow grave reeking with decay and reluctantly uncovering what remained of Nelson Pritchard, his skull cracked open hinting at some unspeakable violence unleashed on him. Continuing deeper into the forest now driven by personal reasons for Abigail, and sheer curiosity for me we eventually crossed paths with a group of terrified locals, led by Cynthia Hollis herself. Together, we recounted our discoveries thus far, and Cynthia spoke of another creature she had caught a glimpse of earlier, 
one she could only describe as a hulking, beast-like figure moving with animalistic agility. With some encouraging words and a reminder that firearms were at our disposal if needed, we pressed on. In the distance, we could see what appeared to be an old barn partially consumed by the ever-advancing forest. Entering the barn cautiously, we found more evidence that would shake the core of sense and reason. Pairs of human remains stacked upon one another, creating a horrifying sculpture that clearly incorporated elements of bones and flesh carefully designed by the elusive antagonist itself. As we regrouped after this gruesome discovery and tried to make sense of it all, I mentioned an old legend told to me when I was a child, the Wendigo, a monstrous, supernatural creature said to stalk remote areas preying on humans. Although this suggestion was met with skepticism, the fear in each person's eyes betrayed their belief that this terrifying legend was more than just a story. The sudden guttural growl emanating from behind us shook us from our thoughts, and we fell into an instinctive defensive stance. The sound alerted us to what seemed like an enormous mass advancing quickly towards us from out of the darkness at once ragged breathing tumbled through space interspersed with swift yet vicious sounds as something vicious was forging its way to us closing in. As everyone braced themselves, the sight of this terrifying being appeared before us, bizarrely twisted limbs supporting its enormous, hunched frame with elongated claws dragging heavily across the ground leaving behind deep gouges in its wake. Cynthia screamed, Shoot! But her voice cracked and only served to ratchet up the tension as I along with the others raised our firearms, our hands shaking from the mix of terror and adrenaline that gripped us all. The creature lunged at us with monstrous force and brutality. The air reeked of its foul breath, suffocating our senses and clouding our thoughts. I fired my gun towards it, but my unstable hands didn't offer much accuracy. Others joined in, but the flurry of bullets seemed to only provoke it further. Run! Everyone, run! I screamed as the beast continued its onslaught. We scattered in various directions, leaving behind the horrifying sight of our injured and fallen comrades. I sprinted without knowing where my legs would take me, panic overriding any semblance of reason. My breath grew heavy as desperation consumed every fiber of my being. The creature appeared undeterred by our attempts at defense or escape. It pursued us with relentless vigor, its claws shredding through the earth in a symphony of destruction. Our screams echoed throughout the darkness, reverberating like haunting reminders of this nightmarish ordeal. I stumbled upon a small cabin ahead, and with no other option in sight, I rushed inside and bolted the door shut as best as I could. A hodgepodge of dusty old books filled the shelves within the cluttered space, likely an abandoned hunter's haven. Footsteps approached from outside as some others managed to find refuge in the cabin as well. The grounded tremors and distant roars indicated that the creature hadn't deviated from our pursuit. We knew we couldn't stay here for long. Quick! Check if there's anything useful around here! Peter blurted out frantically. We rummaged through stacks of hunting equipment— and papers when Cynthia discovered a dusty old book falling apart near one corner. I think this could help. She stammered hesitantly, flipping through yellowed pages that depicted strange creatures' artwork, similar to what we encountered earlier. These illustrations, they remind me dash. The tension was palpable, leaving us with no time for contemplation. Without warning, a fierce growl punctured the air, paralyzing all of us for a brief second. We braced ourselves as the door began to buckle under the creature's blows. Listen! You need to call emergency services right now! I told Cynthia, thrusting my cell phone into her shaky hands. The reception is poor, but it might just work. As we steeled ourselves for the impending onslaught, Peter grabbed a nearby shotgun 
and started loading shells into its chamber. The rest of us, armed with whatever makeshift weapons we could find, prepared for the worst. As the orchestrated violence outside intensified, our apprehension threatened to swallow us whole. But then, something unexpected happened. The creature's anger seemed to wane, and its rampage ebbed away as suddenly as it arrived. I got through! They're sending help! Cynthia exclaimed in relief and disbelief. The realization that we might survive dawned on all of us. We cautiously stepped out of our temporary refuge, horrified by the sights that lay before us. The carnage strewn across our once peaceful campsite would live on as an unforgiving memory. The shock had nearly numbed us from remembering the one hope we had left, Cynthia's book. As emergency services arrived on site and evacuated those wounded in the ordeal, they soon surrounded an expert who had come along, a folklorist who specialized in creatures of myth and lore. We showed her the book Cynthia found, and she proceeded to study it thoroughly. It appears you may have encountered a Wendigo, she explained somberly after much examination. While it was difficult for us to accept such a supernatural happening, every other explanation fell short in explaining what we had experienced that terrifying night. As we mourned our fallen friends and departed from that dreadful place, I couldn't shake off the lingering thoughts about the beast. How could such an encounter have occurred? The folklorist's words reverberated in my ears, giving life to the chilling question that haunted each one of us. Are there more creatures like the Wendigo lurking in the shadows, waiting to strike? Only time would tell. It was almost dusk when I decided to take a walk through the woods behind my house. I'm Guillermo Fletcher, an amateur wildlife photographer and I had recently moved to this remote corner of Wyoming. For as long as I could remember, I had been fascinated by untouched wilderness, and it was about time I explored my new surroundings. A pine cone crunched underfoot, a sound that always put me in a good mood. Walking nonchalantly deeper into the trees, I played back some memories of my college years in my head, the parties late-night conversations, and laughs shared. As the thought lingered, the darkness settled in, and a sudden cold breeze sent shivers down my spine. Rubbing my hands together for warmth, I continued through the forest. The path ahead split into two directions. Thick fog hung over one path while the other seemed clear and well-trodden. Without much thought, I chose the clear one and continued on. Not long after turning onto the path, piercing screams cut through the silence. Startled by such an unnatural noise coming from seemingly nowhere, confusion washed over me. There were no neighbors for miles around us. Who could be suffering out here? Resolved to find out where it was coming from, I followed the noise with hesitant steps. As I got closer to its source, I noticed a giant structure looming in the near distance. It appeared to be an old derelict cabin encased in overgrowth. With every step forward and each involuntary crunch of leaves beneath my feet, my heartbeat quickened. Is anyone there? I shouted hesitantly. I heard screaming, Do you need help? No response came, just eerie silence enveloping me once more. Gathering courage from deep within myself, I approached the cabin's door without making a sound and gave it a gentle push. It creaked open with a shudder. What I saw inside made my blood run cold. The room was lit dimly by moonlight, revealing the mangled, bloodied corpse of a fellow hiker, a look of pure terror etched across his lifeless face. Suppressing the urge to vomit, I reached for my phone to call the police but realized I had no reception this far out in the woods. Before I could even consider my options, an inhuman growl emanated from somewhere within the cabin. 
emerging from the shadows came a grotesque creature, unlike anything I had ever seen, and possibly tall with unnaturally long limbs and sharp talons. Its once human face twisted into an unrecognizable snarl. With an adrenaline-fueled jolt, I bolted back towards my own home without looking back, worried that if I did, I would see this monstrous hybrid hot on my heels. As I ran through the dense trees and began to approach my house, I glanced back to see if it was still pursuing me. In that split second, vines lashed out and entangled my legs. I fell hard into the cold earth and attempted to free myself from their grasp. The horror of what might follow if caught fueled an unmatched urgency to escape. Flinging off the vines and gasping for breath, I continued running despite the pain shooting up my legs. As I limped up to my house, I fumbled for my keys and hastily locked the door behind me. Unsure of what to do next, I knew I had to think rationally. I needed help, but who would believe the nightmarish ordeal I just witnessed? I remembered my neighbor, Sarah, who was a nurse. She might be able to help me with my injuries without asking too many questions, at least until we could figure out what we were dealing with. Sarah was always friendly and approachable, making her an ideal source of support under these circumstances. Determined and in pain, I dialed Sarah's number, hoping she was still awake at this hour. Hey, it's me from next door. Sorry for calling so late but I really need your help right now. Within minutes, Sarah arrived at my doorstep looking concerned. She asked no questions as she hurriedly tended to my wounds in silence. As she wrapped bandages around my legs and made sure there was no significant damage or bleeding, I couldn't help but consider the risks of involving her in this horrifying situation. Still unsure about the grotesque creature that had relentlessly pursued me through the woods just minutes earlier, a dread settled in the pit of my stomach. I know this is going to sound crazy, I began hesitantly. But there's something in the woods, something horrifying and dangerous. Sarah raised a skeptical eyebrow but didn't interrupt. I can't explain it, I continued. There's nothing logical about it. All I know is that it killed someone, a fellow hiker, mercilessly. And more than that, it's after me too. Her expression shifted as realization washed over her face. A recognition of sincerity in my voice prompted an unexpected response. You know, she said softly, I've heard whispers in town about something like what you're describing living deep within the woods. They say it hunts at night, stalking its victims like some kind of vicious predator. My heart sank. Her words only fueled my fear. We both knew that this creature was unlike any natural predator. Sarah suggested that we lock all the doors and windows, turn off the lights, and stay quiet. She wanted to minimize our chances of being detected by the creature while we figured out our next move. As we sat in hushed darkness, I couldn't help but notice that Sarah was not as frightened as I was. Instead, she seemed determined to uncover information that could help us survive this ordeal. After hours spent frantically researching on her phone and making calls to local officials, she finally discovered something vital to our survival. It's called a lumbrican, said Sarah, her voice quivering slightly as she shared her findings. It's an ancient creature from local folklore believed to live in these woods for centuries, hunting and feeding on unsuspecting victims. Her words sent shivers down my spine as we both came to the realization that this nightmare we were living might not end any time soon. We need to leave, I whispered, my voice barely audible. We need to get somewhere safe until we can figure out how to deal with this thing once and for all. Sarah nodded in agreement. We hastily grabbed some essentials and raced to her car. As the engine roared to life, our heartbeats quickened, 
aware that every second could mean life or death. Driving away from everything that felt familiar, we were painfully aware of the darkness that lay beyond the scope of the car's headlights. The road seemed endless and unforgivingly eerie under the moonlit sky as if fate itself had pushed us into an abyss of uncertainty. Only one thing remained clear. Our lives had been forever changed by the sinister presence of the lumberkin. And although it felt impossible at times, I vowed I would never give up on finding a way to confront it, driven by the determination to overcome my fears and ensure that no one else would fall victim to its monstrous cruelty. This happened to me about ten years ago while working in Klamath National Forest, California. My name is Malcolm Neal, and my job as a forest worker entailed checking the health of trees and maintaining trails. That day, I was chatting with my buddy Gareth Cooper, also a forest worker. We shared stories of our hometowns as we walked through the dense woods. My life in Reading wasn't particularly interesting. I dealt with a tumultuous family life, which made me pick up this job to seek solace in nature. And Gareth's stories about his bland accounting job before he decided to switch careers were always amusing. Unexpectedly, during our routine inspection, we stumbled upon an eerie scene, a makeshift campsite. There were torn clothes covered in what looked like dried blood scattered around. The sight instantly terrified us. Being skeptical, we assumed a wild animal attacked the camper and left traces of destruction behind. We decided to call for help but found out there was no cell phone reception in that remote area of the forest. We noted the location and planned to report it once we finished our work. As we continued deeper into the woods, exchanging occasional jokes to lighten the mood, a cluttering sound caught our attention, brush rustling and twigs snapping behind us. Turning around, a gruesome figure stood before us. This creature looked emaciated, like it hadn't eaten in days. Its limbs were gnarled and elongated with sharp claws on its fingertips. It had sunken eye sockets encasing white pupils while its tattered skin barely covered skeletal features. Fear stricken but determined not to back down, Gareth grabbed the only weapon we had, a small folding saw from his tool belt, and charged at the creature yelling some kind of war cry to intimidate it hoping that would buy us time to flee. With swift movements, the creature disarmed him swiftly before disappearing back into the forest where it came from. Gareth looked pale and terrified. We quickly gathered our belongings anxious to leave that area as fast as our legs would carry us. We ventured briskly back towards base camp, discussing how the creature could have been responsible for the grisly scene we encountered earlier. Our conversations were filled with whispered theories and occasional morbid humor, but inside, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Reaching base camp at last gave us some respite. We reported the unsettling events to our supervisor, who informed us an investigation would be launched by local authorities. The next day at work, we couldn't help but glance over our shoulders as we continued our daily duties. An air of dread lingered over us. One moment it could seem like everything was ordinary, just another day at work, and then suddenly unbearable fear from the thought of encountering that creature again. I met with Jasper Perkins, a maintenance worker we hadn't seen in weeks since he usually worked solo further into the forest on machinery checkups. Poor guy seemed exhausted, eyes swollen from sleepless nights when I asked how he'd been holding up. You know. He managed a forced smile with an attempt at sarcasm in his tone. Living the American dream, alone in the freaking woods. Jasper's condition only heightened my anxiety about what lay deep within Klamath National Forest. Dread built up as rumors spread throughout camp, 
locals recounting tales of mysterious disappearances and other strange occurrences. Hearing local stories made it harder to ignore this unsettling reality. One day, several armed officers visited our campsite to update us on their progress investigating the gruesome sightings in our area. Apparently, missing person reports had rapidly increased over recent weeks. Tension mounted as they explained the potential connection between these unsolved cases and that horrifying creature Gareth and I encountered. Officers strongly advised forest workers to carry firearms for protection against this unknown menace. This decision was a wake-up call for everyone to confront the situation seriously. Gareth, a veteran hunter, nervously taught several colleagues and me how to handle guns for self-defense on our excursions into the woods. As time crept on, Klamath National Forest seemed more alive with fear. Each rustling leaf brought suspicion and dread. We carried out our duties in tense silences instead of exchanging jokes and banter like before. One evening after we returned from our assigned tasks, we found our camp in disarray. Tents had been shredded open, and blood stained the ground. Panic set in, and we started calling out for our missing colleagues, believing something terrible had happened to them. Jasper! I shouted, frantically searching for him. No response. My heart raced as I stumbled upon the remains of one of our crew members. It was unimaginable. A guttural growl echoed through the trees, and we all stopped, listening intently. The creature we all feared had come for us. It was lurking nearby. We readied our firearms as fear clawed at our throats. As if responding to an unheard signal, the creature barreled into the clearing, revealing its terrifying appearance. A deformed body covered in tattered skin barely stretched over elongated limbs and bony protrusions, a face devoid of any recognizable features except for its menacingly exposed teeth and vacant eye sockets oozing with an unnatural liquid. This was no creature out of known existence. We opened fire as it lunged at us with unprecedented speed and ferocity. One by one, members of our crew were attacked and mauled, their screams cut short by the vicious creature's merciless rampage. I managed to elude death by scrambling up a nearby tree to relative safety while below me, chaos reigned. But I could only watch in horrified silence as several of my friends lost their lives to the vicious onslaught below me. The creature finally retreated into the dense underbrush after leaving behind a gruesome scene that would be seared into my memory forever. Lifeless bodies mangled beyond recognition, gore staining the once peaceful forest floor. Survivors called for help on radios, reached out to anyone who could come to our aid before this monstrous menace returned. The response was swift. Teams armed with heavier weapons arrived at our devastated camp and set up a perimeter, their goal to track and kill this nightmarish predator once and for all. We survivors, disheartened and overwhelmed with grief, huddled together and shared our disbelief. Everything we knew about the world had been brutally shattered, leaving us with the undeniable fact we had never faced anything like this before. Days passed as we grieved our lost colleagues. Under the watchful eyes of our armed protectors, we did our part, fixing what could be salvaged from the campsite wreckage. We couldn't help but feel unnerved even with the security measures in place. Finally, a hunting party returned with the creature's bloody remains. Their triumph was palpable, tainted only by the price we'd paid for it in lives lost. We learned later that they'd found its lair deep within the forest, a grim cavern littered with gnawed bones from its unlucky prey. At least now we could honor our fallen friends through burial rites they deserved. As their bodies were laid to rest amid hushed eulogies, I couldn't help but remember my last conversation with Jasper, his attempt at sarcastic humor before his agonizing end at the hands of that terrible being. 
With heavy hearts, we left Klamath National Forest behind us, swallowed and lost to nature's unyielding grip as it had been for generations before us. As I write this account, sitting safely behind my desk in an office devoid of horrors lurking beyond shadows, I cannot help but wonder what other abominations are hiding within forest's depths. If such an indescribable terror could have lain undetected for so long before erupting into our world like a nightmare made manifest, what else could be out there waiting its turn to strike? Such questions may forever haunt me. If there is any lesson learned from our grim ordeal in Klamath National Forest it is that sometimes there are phenomena that lie beyond our understanding, things we cannot control or defeat with the limited knowledge and resources at our disposal. Yet life goes on, and we must be prepared to face whatever darkness emerges from the woods. For the sake of those who died and for those who yet live, we must endure and persevere lest we allow ourselves to be consumed by the fear of the unknown. This happened to me six years ago, working near Lake Erie, Pennsylvania. My name is Leopold Gresham, a forest worker responsible for checking remote areas. There I was, examining trees for diseased bark when I heard a rustling from behind. Swinging my axe defensively but found nothing. A co-worker, Vincenzo Barton, sauntered to my side with his playful grin. Leo, are you talking to squirrels again? He joked. No, Vinny, I responded with an eye roll. It was just a bit louder than your average critter. Despite the daunting woods surrounding us, we continued our work. Locals often spoke of bizarre happenings in the area, missing persons and mangled deer carcasses, but that's just idle chatter in a small town. Still, Vinny and I took turns surveying the surroundings while the other focused on inspecting trees. That day we heard wild howls in the distance, unlike any animal we would typically hear in these parts instead of dwelling too much on it. We carried on until our shift ended. The following Tuesday, another forester reported a slaughtered deer they found during their shift. The news made its way back to our station. We exchanged glances but remained silent. As uncomfortable as we were with such things happening in our workplace, the idea of calling for help didn't come up. It wasn't our duty to become paranormal detectives, after all. Days turned into weeks without further incident, lulling us into believing these strange occurrences were rare flukes. Then one day, while deep in the woods closer to Lake Erie shores than usual, we found signs of something unusual, impressions reminiscent of human footprints embedded within fresh dirt near an overgrown section. As forest workers more accustomed to flora than fauna encounters we couldn't accurately discern what creatures might leave such marks. However, the elongated toes and claw-like appendages would argue against any likelihood of a known animal. Unease crept through our bodies, but we pressed on with unspoken dedication to our jobs. In the back of our heads, we knew calling help wouldn't sit well with our supervisors or co-workers it would only invite ridicule or scorn. Then he tried lightening my spirits. Hey, Leo, did I ever tell you about the time my uncle caught a raccoon trying to break into his truck? That little bandit scurried off when it heard him coming. As we chuckled at his absurd stories, I couldn't help feel that perhaps laughter was the best antidote for fear. Heading deeper into the woods, I only hoped that life continued as usual. If there was anything beyond the trees we could deal with it head-on without hesitation. We took breaks every hour because walking all day in thick forestry proved tiresome. During one rest, Vinny noticed a partially concealed cave opening concealed by vines and foliage. Our curiosity was piqued. However, entering such an unknown area seemed ill-advised. 
A nagging feeling drew me closer to explore but ultimately decided against it. Work came first even with unforeseen circumstances thrown our way. As darkness began eclipsing daylight hours, growing shadows cast an eerie air over the dense forest. Amid our vigilance amidst low-hanging branches and roots protruding from the earth, I lost sight of Vinny for a moment. He must have ventured ahead while my eyes adjusted to twilight's dim glow taking hold. I called out for him but received no response. Instead, more rustling sounds echoed in the distance. Panic set in as I envisioned what gruesome fate may have befallen my friend, casting aside all rationality and building paranoia each passing second. Sprinting through woods filled with untold dangers seemed like madness, yet every fiber within me screamed to find Vinny before it was too late. I could feel my heart pounding as sweat cascaded down my face. Fear's cold embrace enveloped me nonetheless. No matter how fearful I was or how absurd such situations might seem, abandoning a colleague wasn't possible even if risks mounted against us. And then, with his name still hanging heavy on my breath, something lunged at me from the darkness. Coming face to face with an unknown creature that embodied both human and animal elements sent tremors of terror down my spine. Its elongated limbs covered in coarse fur moved with fluid agility, while inhuman eyes pierced through the encroaching night. I stared at the creature in shock, unable to process what stood before me. Its matted fur suggested a life lived in the wild, while its distinctly human face made my head spin with confusion. Before I could assess our situation further, the creature lunged at me once more. As it sprang forward, I dodged out of its way, narrowly escaping its grasp. My main concern, however, was finding Vinny and alerting others to the danger we faced. I scrambled back to my feet and shouted for Vinny once more, desperately hoping he would hear me. Out of nowhere, Vinny emerged from the nearby bushes. He shot a terrified glance at the creature before yelling back to me, Go! Get help! I'll try to keep it away from you! I nodded quickly and began running, my legs carrying me faster than they ever had before. As I glanced back for a brief moment, I saw Vinny bravely waving his arms and shouting at the creature in an attempt to draw its attention away from me. With my heart pounding in my ears, I sprinted towards the area where we parked our vehicles earlier in the day. Reaching them felt like an eternity. No matter how fast I ran or how far I went, it seemed like the nightmare would never end. Eventually locating our trucks, I fumbled with my keys and unlocked the driver's side door of Vinny's truck. Quickly grabbing his radio from the dashboard, I frantically yelled into it, Help! We're being attacked by some kind of creature in the forest. It's dangerous! We need help immediately. There was only static in response to my plea for several agonizing seconds until finally a voice came through. We hear you loud and clear. Backup is on its way. Stay where you are. Relieved that reinforcements were on their way, I realized that I had left Vinny alone to face the monster. My stomach churned with guilt and dread as I ran back into the darkened forest desperately wanting to provide any assistance I could. As I neared the spot where I'd left Vinny, I could hear his voice growing fainter and the sounds of conflict gradually subsiding. Arriving on scene, my heart sank as I saw the creature looming over Vinny's motionless body before it darted away into the shadows. The following hours were a blur of chaos and confusion. Our colleagues arrived with local authorities and animal management experts in tow. All efforts were focused on capturing the elusive creature that had inflicted such terror upon us, while paramedics tended to Vinny's injuries. Thankfully, they were able to stabilize him, though he would require extensive medical care. As our work took on a new meaning, 
several of us spent hours analyzing photographs of the creature we had captured during our pursuit. Obsessing over its every detail, we compared it to existing animal species but found no match, offering no explanation as to what it was or where it came from. In our heart of hearts, we knew that even if it was caught or killed, the questions surrounding its existence would ultimately remain unanswered. In the following weeks, Vinny recovered slowly but surely. We often reminisced about that harrowing night, while some sought solace in their faith or sought therapy to process their trauma, others took refuge in their work. For many of us, including Vinny and myself, moving forward meant letting go of what we couldn't control and focusing on rebuilding our lives. Yet deep down, I knew that fearsome memory would never truly leave me. Years have passed since that fateful encounter, and even though life has taken me far from those dark woods where we face the unknown together, I often find myself reflecting upon that experience with bittersweet sentiment. The night instilled in me not just a fear of the unknown, but a responsibility to care for those who dwell within it. I'll never forget Vinny's brave actions, and neither of us will ever be the same. The moment my gaze fell upon the strange carcass nestled among the dense undergrowth, an icy shroud settled around my heart. My name is Conrad Marlowe, a fire lookout assigned to a secluded tower in Monongahela National Forest, West Virginia. This was not the usual deer ravaged by predators. The remains were almost methodically displayed, lacking any carnivorous chaos one would expect. That morning had begun like any other, pure solitude amongst ancient pines and crisp air. But today, a nauseating stench replaced the scent of pine needles, a foul, coppery tang of blood that lured me from my watchtower. As I ventured further to investigate, thoughts of my daughter, Eliza, surfaced unbidden. Our conversations about the stars and her measured steps over gnarled roots haunted me with each stride through the familiar yet intimidating woodland expanse. Still reeling from the grotesque discovery, I heard rustling. It was a narrow clearing downwind where I spotted it, an enigma no less gruesome than what it left behind. It was large, its coat matted with detritus from the forest floor. The creature moved with precise and eerily quiet steps that contradicted its formidability. I cautiously made note of its direction and proceeded to follow at a safe distance. Only Alice, my old friend and fellow lookout stationed in the southern section of the forest, might believe such a tale without ridiculing me for absurdity. We met at Relay Point Echo where I relayed the morbid details over coffee that was more grounds than liquid. Her laughter filled our brief respite with ease as she joked about city folk not lasting a minute out here with Bambi's more realistic side. Yet when we parted ways and dusk threatened to engulf the forest horizon, an uneasy silence took hold. Night descended like a curtain call for civility among wildlife, as every snap of twigs magnified in menace. Watchful from my loyal perch atop the watchtower, I readied myself to radio authorities about my find once dawn permitted clarity, a decision that came too late. Inky shadows shifted below, forming an opaque ocean hauntingly akin to swaying tall grass rather than blackness pregnant with dread, until it advanced toward me. There's something soberingly stark about acceptance when facing mortality in isolation that this tower may become my mausoleum in this verdant wasteland haunted by an earthly yet alien presence. Its ascent up the tower's stairs did not yield noisy protests, nor did it thrash against each stairwell landing. It climbed with purpose and stealth that belied its bulk. Stepping back, I reached for the radio, only to find it dead. I recalled the earlier storm that must have damaged the tower's equipment 
leaving me alone and cut off. The sound of deliberate steps on the stairs grew closer. In the moonlight through my window, I saw it, its fur, black and sleek over robust muscles, eyes reflecting light like a predator. Maybe a bear, but one unlike any I had catalogued during my years in the woods. The door creaked open. It filled the frame, its heavy paws leaving impressions on the wooden floor. Escape was not an option. The drop from the window too steep and the creature blocked my only exit. It approached with an unnerving mix of curiosity and purpose, sniffing the air as if scent alone would divulge my story. Sudden brightness flooded the room as Alice burst through with her torchlight affixed onto her rifle. The creature recoiled from the glare and retreated hastily down the stairs. Alice motioned to follow her, a chance to escape this nightmarish visitation. We descended cautiously, eyes fixed where we last saw it vanish into darkness. At ground level, evidence of its presence was clear. Deep gashes in the bark of nearby trees and ground trampled beneath powerful strides. But it was gone. In her truck, we kept silent until we reached town. Here we reported the incident, all facts, no speculation, and waited as rangers scoured our posts for clues. They found none, no carcass or blood indicated fatality. After that night, our routines resumed with one change. The creature's existence noted in unspoken but shared warnings to be vigilant, as we preserve these woods teeming with unseen life. I stepped into the woods near Green Ridge State Forest, Maryland, feeling the crisp air brush against my skin. A perfect day to hunt, I thought to myself, loading my rifle. Fresh out of a divorce and needing some solitude, this was my first hunt in months. Making my way deeper into the forest, I enjoyed the quiet serenity all around me. I recalled how my father had taught me to track and hunt as a young boy. Hunting was more than a hobby. It connected me to my roots. The only other person in my life who understood this passion was a fellow hunter named John Maynard. The tranquility was suddenly interrupted as I stumbled upon an odd sight. A deep gash cut into the trunk of an ancient tree stood out from the surrounding foliage. I knew every inch of Green Ridge, but had never seen anything like this. Examining it more closely, it didn't resemble typical claw marks one might expect from a bear or other large predator. Experiencing unease tingling through my spine that I couldn't shake off, I continued with my hunt. A couple of paces later, leaves crunching underfoot, I noticed ravens circling overhead. John once told me that wherever ravens appear, trouble is never too far away. As twilight descended upon the forest, the sound of footsteps reached me from behind. Using caution and sharp senses were essential for hunting. A mistake could prove costly. Turning around slowly, rifle ready, I beheld something monstrous yet horrifyingly captivating, a grotesque amalgamation of flesh and sinew barely resembling a living creature at all. Its eyes bore into mine with chilling clarity that belied its gruesome appearance. They held discolorations that suggested what could have been remnants of multiple creatures combined together into whatever it was standing before me now. This being lurked just beyond the tree line wearily examining me with predatory purpose, before shifting its gaze towards the gash on the tree. The connection was unmistakable. Without muttering words, I whispered into my walkie-talkie, John, something is not right. Just found this thing. With each step I took backward, it matched my pace forward as if engaged in a perverse dance with me. The forest transformed into a realm of inexplicable terror. This creature had stained it with an aura that brought forth only bloodshed and pain. As the tension between us grew unbearable, 
I made my choice. I raised the rifle to my shoulder and took aim. Fearing for John's safety, I said into the walkie-talkie one last time, John, just stay away. The gunshot pierced through the fragile silence of dusk. My body plunged into freefall as gravity and adrenaline combined to propel me towards an abyss that would eventually swallow us all. The creature advanced towards me, moving like a predator claiming its prey. My heartbeat accelerated, pumping adrenaline throughout my body. I knew I could not run it, but I had to try. Despite my fear, I ran deeper into the woods, branches snapping beneath my feet. I could hear the grotesque sound of the creature's movements too, drawing nearer with every stride. John! Help! There's something here! I screamed into the walkie-talkie, hoping he was still within range to hear me. As if in response to my cries for help, a low growl emerged from behind, increasing in volume and intensity. It matched the pounding in my ears as panic drowned out logic. Persisting on pure instinct, I sprinted further into the darkness as fast as I could. A few moments later, John's voice crackled through the walkie-talkie. Hold on! I'm coming! With hope restored, my mind raced to figure out how best to escape, or at least slow down this relentless monster. Thoughts of altering my course filled my head maybe if I took a sharp turn or climbed a tree. No sooner had the thought entered my mind than did an ear-splitting roar shatter the silence. My entire being trembled with terror, as I realized that the creature was now only a few steps away. Thinking quickly and propelled by pure desperation, I turned to face it and fired another round from my rifle just as it lunged at me. The shot slammed into its shoulder, causing the monstrous beast to cry out in pain and fall to its knees. For a second, just one fleeting moment, relief washed over me as the nightmare seemed temporarily halted. But that respite was short-lived as it returned with a vengeance. A guttural growl erupted from within its hideous form as it began clawing at the earth in an attempt to stand back up. As I desperately tried to reload my rifle, it managed to regain its footing and darted towards me once more. Pain overwhelmed my body as its claws raked across my leg, hot blood spilling onto the forest floor. John! I screamed into the walkie-talkie, grasping my leg in agony. The mixture of pain, fear, and shouting added a new layer of disorientation. Darkness threatened to envelop me. The world felt like it was spinning around me. Stay with me. I'm here. John's voice boomed through the walkie-talkie, embracing me with their warmth. I see you. Hold on. With those reassuring words ringing in my ears, I pressed on deeper into the woods as John continued to communicate his location. Guided by his support, we found each other not far from the creature's last strike. It had given up the chase, at least for now. We wasted no time in bandaging my wound with a cloth ripped from John's shirt. Supporting each other, we retreated from the dark, twisted realm that had been a nightmare for so long. Two days later, after our harrowing escape and safe return home, authorities had been made aware of our traumatic encounter. A search ensued, but to no avail. Nothing was found that could confirm or deny our story. Some considered us lucky to leave with our lives. Others saw us as just two more victims struggling to make sense of the unexplainable. As time passed and our lives moved forward— as mundane existence returned, I couldn't help but carry a sliver of terror within me. Every noise in the night summoned images of those cold, unnerving eyes. Every forest walk reminded me of how close I had come to meeting my end. Ever since that day in the woods where we faced something unfathomable, part beast and part nightmare, both John and I have struggled in silence with the weight of our experience. And while our bond has never wavered, 
a primal fear continues to seep into our dreams. In the end, there is no return to normalcy. We have gazed into the abyss, and it has indelibly marked us both. Though we will never forget those we lost along the way, it is now up to us to live and fight another day, a testimony to the strength of human spirit in the face of unimaginable horror. It was one of those mornings when the air seemed sharper, a tangible reminder that nature isn't always as nurturing as we like to believe. I'm not the type to spout poetry about the wild or ramble on wistfully about the fall foliage. I'm more of a facts and evidence kind of guy. Names? Well, folks around here call me Tate Garver, which suits me since you won't find a crowd chanting my name or anything. The U.S. government doesn't advertise jobs in my line of work. See, tucked away in the dense main woods near Allagash is a laboratory so secretive most would mistake it for an old lumber mill at best. Not much in terms of company except for Dr. Avis Newby, an eccentric with qualifications as long as her list of phobias, and Crossley Iverson, who could track an ant through a hurricane and never miss a beat. We were deep into genetic experiments that sound more like science fiction than reality. I'm talking about altering the very fabric of life itself. On this particular day, our endeavor took us to the crossroads where ambition meets reckoning. The day unfolded with its usual monotony until Iverson rushed in, his face paler than birch bark. You ever seen tracks as big as dinner plates? He panted, dropping his hefty backpack with a thud. Garbled radio calls indicated something was amiss. Those trail cameras better reveal more than just shy deer today. I retorted half-jokingly whilst reloading my Glock, a protocol when venturing outside into our backyard. Stepping outside, Dr. Newby followed suit. Her tool of choice was the tranquilizer gun she called Plan B. Now, getting chilled in these woods is nothing new. But when you come across viscera that seems almost artistically strung between trees and observe tracks that speak of no known creature walking earth, unsettling doesn't begin to cover it. Probably just another bear. I lied more to myself than to Nubi, who turned several shades whiter at the sight of crimson mesh against the autumnal forest floor. A crackle from above drew our gaze. Nestled high within tree limbs was what looked like. Remains? No living person could pull off such gruesome decorum, certainly not without being seen or heard by us first. We advanced cautiously toward what we presumed was deer carcass salvageable for study. Wrong assumption entirely. Suspended amid branches was our colleague Bracken Hale, whom we left back at base with enough riddles to keep him occupied till evening, or so we thought. As Iverson mumbled what could have been prayers or curses under his breath, we all scanned every shadow that December day allowed. Something watched us. I could sense it in their strained whispers of breeze to bow. Hence our silence. Why call for help when it'll likely arrive just timely enough to draft incident reports? Newby kept muttering possible predators localized to these parts, but none with the cunning required for this predatory display of dominance, or warning given Hugh's present condition. Our returning steps echoed louder against tree trunks as we hightailed back towards relative safety. Words failed us. Eyes didn't need to speak shared terror though mine remained glued back over my shoulder. Now logic dictated that no folklore beast lumbered through these woods. But logic also had no business explaining the fragments of odd fur caught on broken branches nor the way darkness around us felt alive with malevolent observation. Iverson and Newby were several paces ahead when a monstrous silhouette dislodged itself from one tree's shadows moving towards another further on, gaunt yet upright walking with loping grace bound not by earthly rules. 
We sped back inside, barricading ourselves, yet scarcely believing locked doors meant safety anymore. Everything prior seemed laughably trivial compared to this entity whose existence danced mocking tangos around plausibility. We armed ourselves readying for whatever nightmare lurked beyond fortified metal and shatterproof windows that evening all while heated debates flitted between how and why, and ultimately who would go out again. No sense fretting over possibilities if we're all dead by morning. Quipped Iverson trying levity. Few found humor as night's curtain rose thick around us shelter concealing untold threats just awaiting darkness's peak canvas for fuller revelation. Hours passed like days within the sealed confines of that besieged space. It was Newby who first noted the absence of any outside noise, no insects, nor wind against the walls. An unnatural silence had laid its pall over the area. Iverson proposed it could be some large predator. Wildlife unsettled by its presence would have fled. Call it hysteria in that environment. His words caused eyes to dart and fingers to tighten on makeshift weapons. We reasoned, despite the unknown menace, sitting like ducks wasn't an option. Newby suggested a plan, a rush for one of our trucks parked down the path. It had been noted that no vehicle sounds broke the stillness. Cell service had been unreliable since our arrival. To wager on a slim chance seemed folly but preferable to waiting for daylight or whatever hunted us. In twos, we'd run for it, starting with Crosby and Dean. Both hailed from ranches and boasted about their sprinting prowess on open fields. Iverson grimaced but stayed silent perhaps thinking of past hunts where predators picked off those who strayed from safety. I checked my watch. By unspoken agreement, we timed their dash in case we needed to reconsider options. Minutes stretched until Newby pointed out that neither man returned nor made any vocal cue of success or distress. The next pair hesitated. Questions loomed regarding whether help would come without us reaching town. When crunching sounds echoed outside, we hushed. Heartbeats replaced conversation. A crash against the metal door made us all flinch as a figure slammed into the windows. It was Crosby or Dean, indistinct in blood and terror. Hope dissipated with his fall back into darkness crushed by a shape rooted in nightmares but stark in its reality. Large enough to dwarf even a bear— Bipedal but grossly disproportional, claws and muscle gleamed before snuffing out another light amongst us. We scattered away from openings. Logic deemed it a rare giant predator pushed towards humans by encroaching civilization or climate change. No one spoke thoughts aloud anymore. It stalled us the remainder of the night. Poor Taylor grasped at bravery and was taken through shattered glass after a fateful glimpse outside. By dawn, fatigue numbed us rather than fear when police sounds finally startled us awake, arriving due to missed check-ins rather than any successful call for aid. Rescue seemed unreal after what felt like ageless horror. Yet hefty boot treads replaced gaunt footsteps and facts faced myths down. We talked of bears grown monstrous, though I caught officers' exchange looks when claws not quite ursine were described. Injuries were recorded methodically. Crosby's remains called an animal attack. This creature no ranger whispered names of nor scientists speculated openly about its species beyond our hearing loss range. Newby suggested not speaking much about it during hospital recovery despite therapist's prods what credence would be given. Back home my noticed news told tales of exceptional bears with rare genetic abnormalities. Discussions halted there. The woods remained closed. Martyrs unspoken barred entry with red tape rather than awe of surviving feats against nature gone at barren remembrance, only for those present in that time marked by shadows taking shape to rend flesh. Yet when dusk falls and wilderness calls at edges of perception, dare anyone heed such whispers again?
I awoke to the sound of footsteps outside my cabin on the outskirts of Maple Grove, a small town tucked away in the dense green mountain forest. My name is Archie Breitner, and after the recent loss of my wife, I decided to escape the chaos of urban life. Moving here offered me solitude and peace, or so I believed. Feeling uneasy as the crunching leaves grew louder, I grabbed my flashlight and ventured outside into the black night. Weaving through tall oak trees, my heart raced as I neared what sounded like muffled screams emerging from a distant thicket. As my flashlight illuminated the scene, I saw a hiker bruised and battered, tied to a tree while still struggling to break free. Introducing himself as Cedric Abrams, his eyes expressed panic as he begged me to release him, fearing for his life. Why did no one hear your cries? I questioned. I tried yelling, he uttered fearfully. But this place is so remote. Please help. Moments after setting him free, we heard rustling. The air grew tense. We noticed an unnerving form emerging from darkness. Unfamiliar with this creature that watched us with piercing yellow eyes, it stood still on four legs resembling a wolf but twisted into something monstrous. My heart skipped a beat as it let out a guttural growl. Noticing Cedric's knife clipped to his belt, we frantically planned our escape while walking towards the cabin. Just then, Esme Sutton stumbled into view carrying a rifle. Her disheveled appearance screamed distress. She revealed that her husband Roy was missing when she returned to their campsite nearby. Nervously suspecting this beast was responsible for Roy's disappearance intensified our drive to protect ourselves. Regrouping inside Archie's cabin, Fear fueled their conversations as they debated which course of action would give them a fighting chance against the eerie creature roaming outside. Esme's hands shook as she discussed her past as a hunting instructor, feeling her anxiety morph into focus. We need a plan now. We can't wait for it to attack. With newfound determination, they planned an ambush designed to incapacitate the creature. Archie kept watch by the window with Cedric, while Esme prepared her trusty rifle. Hours passed, tension bristling. The darkness outside felt suffocating. Suddenly, a horrifying howl pierced the silence, sending chills down their spines. The dreaded moment had arrived. Remember guys, let's not push our luck, Archie warned urgently. As they spotted movement in the trees, Esme took aim. I just hope these bullets can stop it, she muttered under her breath. Cedric clutched his knife tightly as sweat trickled down his face. The creature lunged from the cover of the trees, its elongated limbs propelling it forward with terrifying speed. Its matted fur was drenched in blood and clumps of torn flesh, making it seem more monstrous than before. Wide, unblinking eyes glared at us, as if to say our feeble attempts at self-preservation were futile in its malevolent presence. We knew it was kill or be killed, and I prayed we had chosen the right plan. Now! I yelled to the others. In a flash, Esme fired her rifle. A loud bang echoed throughout the cabin as Cedric and I threw our makeshift weapons at the beast sharpened sticks tipped with metal shards. Our aim was true. Two sticks lodged themselves in its torso as Esme's bullet hit its shoulder. The creature convulsed in pain, screeching ear-piercing howls that made me wince. We thought we had a chance, but it wasn't enough. With an angry snarl, it ripped the sticks from its body and threw them back at us. Cedric managed to dodge his stick, but mine struck me hard in the chest, knocking me to the ground, winded and bruised. I struggled for breath while my friends continued their desperate attack on the creature. As we fought back with every ounce of energy we had left, I fumbled for my phone and managed to dial 911. My voice cracked as I explained to the dispatcher that we needed help immediately, 
A vicious animal was attacking us at Archie's cabin. I knew they wouldn't arrive soon enough. We were miles into dense forest land populated only by hunting cabins like our own. But it was all I could do. I desperately wanted to act upon my urge to yell out for help from any nearby campers who might be within hearing range, but considered that would surely lead them straight into a death trap. Cedric launched another attack, tackling the beast and pinning it to the floor. Esme saw her opportunity and ran for help from neighboring cabins in search of anyone more prepared to deal with an assailant of this caliber. We didn't have time for reinforcements, but we also couldn't just sit and wait for death. Archie pulled me up, and we quickly searched the cabin for anything that could serve as a weapon against this seemingly unkillable creature. As Cedric grappled with the creature, we found a bear trap in one of Archie's closets. He set the trap, hoping beyond hope that we could use it against our monstrous enemy. With renewed inspiration from our find, I raced to Cedric's side, wielding a fire poker as I slammed it down onto the creature's head. It was momentarily dazed, giving us just enough time for Archie to place the bear trap beneath its flailing body. With precision on his side and strategy at play, Cedric wrested himself free from the creature's grasp just in time for its weight to come crashing down on the bear trap. It snapped shut with a sickening crunch on what passed for the creature's leg, cuts deep between the bones as it howled in pain. The creature thrashed violently but failed to escape its trapping, though it still beckoned danger with its unrestrained strength. Archie helped drag an evidently injured Cedric toward the door. Esme returned not long after, her face filled with relief upon seeing us alive. Helmets clad on her head and in one hand with another rifle slung over her shoulder revealed success. A group of experienced hunters occupied a cabin not too far off who were familiar with this creature and had been planning their own assault. As they approached furtively in position of defense and with weapons at the ready, recounting descriptions of what they claimed were other demonic beasts lurking around the area, we hastily packed our limited belongings and left the cabin, forever haunted by its gruesome memories. Before getting into our vehicles and parting ways, we lingered a moment to remember Roy, whose body was recovered some days later along with evidence of other campers who had not made it out alive. We vowed never to forget those terrifying nights, bound together by shared fear and loss.